Welcome friends to Breakfast in the Ruins and our third and final quickfire Halloween deep dive for 2023. As selected by our patrons, we're taking a look at James Herbert's Domain. As it happens, this also forms a fairly nice and thematically appropriate follow-up to our My Experiences in the Third World War episode, when we look not only at the Mocock collection of short stories, but also a couple of amusingly, albeit terrifyingly stark, British TV current affairs programmes from the early 80s that looked at nuclear war preparation and the likely impact of strikes. As we discussed on that episode, these programmes and conversations and TV movies like Threads and The Day After burned their messages into the public consciousness, and it would appear James Herbert was no exception. The third instalment of his Rats sequence taps fully into that, then Zeitgeist, and gives the reader a full bore horror experience. I'm joined for this one by Phil, my co host, of course, for that My Experiences in the Third World War episode, and Miles, friend of the show and co host of the Casual Trek podcast, who beamed back to Derry and Tom's to follow up on our uncozy catastrophe conversations when we talked about Herbert's The Dark earlier this year. So, construct your inner sanctum. Try to ignore the smell from your hastily constructed homemade chemical toilet. Sit back with a cold tin of beans, carefully rationed of course, and join us as we head into the nuclear hellfire of a demolished London and find the rat's domain. We're back in Derry and Tom's, and of course, it's the spooky Halloween season. So for the spooky Halloween season, of course, we put out our patron poll, which consisted of, I've forgotten what they were already, the cats, slugs, slugs, domain, and something else I have instantly forgotten about. Well, not instantly. Over the last two months, I've obviously forgotten it, and I have no idea what it was off the top of my head. But never mind. Obviously, it wasn't selected anyway, so we went with... Domain by James Herbert, the third in his Rats series. Third of four, technically, because he also did a, a graphic novel illustrated by Ian Miller. Yeah, maybe talk about that another time. But with me to talk about Domain, we've got Miles. Welcome back, Miles. Thank you. Always great to be back. First time back since doing Gore. Oh, I'm impressed that you actually stood up and agreed <laughs> to come back. And we've got Phil. Welcome back, Phil. Hi. Hello. I think I've got it in my contract. No, no more gore novels. No more gore. Yeah. Spearmen of Arn after this. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. No, I don't know what it is either. I've just had it on the shelf for 35 years or more, and I've never actually picked it up or read it. I think it's probably a one shit book. So maybe one day we'll take a look at Spearmen of Arn. But anyway, we're here to do Domain. And of course, Domain, by our standards, is a bit of a chunk of a book. Yeah. But then The Dark was as well, and we managed that, so let's see how we go. Now, let's talk Edition Wars. What edition are you working from, Miles? Okay, I am working from the first published in Great Britain in 1984 by New English Library. You've got the classic cover. That's the one I had when I was at school. The pair of bright red eyes peering from the cover, and it's a wonderful cover. Although. In terms of accuracy, maybe we'll get to that at some point, because in every rat's book, the rat's eyes are always described as yellow. Yet every rat's cover I've seen, with the exception of the one I've got in my hand, the rat's eyes are always red. So the two in New English Library versions of the rats that I've got, the rat's eyes are red. I've got the year after's New English Library edition. So only one year later, they've already changed the cover, and I think it's a ruined St. Paul's Cathedral with a horde of rats in front of it. Once again, staring out the reader. Yeah, yellow eyes in that case. Phil, what have you got? Well, I've also got a New English Library edition, 1985, but it's the most bland cover ever. Mm. I think yours is a 90s reissue. And oh, is it? Yeah, and it's hideous. It's a, a gold cover with silver writing, James Herbert in massive letters, and a tiny silver mushroom cloud at the top that just looks like the tree from the Conservative logo. You see the rat in it? Oh, yeah, there's a little rat in it, yeah. Which, you know, <laughs> is fairly apt for a Conservative Party logo, yeah. I suppose, at the end of the day. Three New English Library editions, three wildly different covers. I would say diminishing returns as these covers went along. Those 90s covers are pretty awful. Maybe designed for people who hate people knowing that they're reading pulp trash 
but yeah just embrace it people that's what i said embrace it and of course our second order of business we need to talk about our libations for the evening because this is going to be probably a lengthy discussion because unlike most of our reads this is well over 400 pages but of course we won't go through it in intimate detail but miles what are you drinking this afternoon right my first brew for the afternoon is a southern tier brewing co caramel pumpkin imperial pumpkin ale um alcohol five eight point six percent by volume and it has a little jack-o'-lantern man on the bottle arts Oh, very nice. Yep. Yeah, excellent. It's the one thing Wisconsin is good for. Yeah. It is its I it is its IPAs and craft beers. Hold on, I've got the bottle now, just to update on that. Vino Regional Lisboa. That's the same as last time. You sure? Oh yeah, that's the same as Crabs on the Rampage wine. Oh you're gonna have to <laughs> you're gonna have to up your game. You're gonna have to up your game. I love the fact that you've got a Halloween themed pumpkin beer. I couldn't find anything like that. So all I could try and go for was the most horrific beer I could lay my hands on from our current collection. So I've got a Field Recordings Monument barrel-aged stout, which, which comes in at 11%. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be horrific, but, you know, we'll give it a go. Here we are to look at and discuss Domain. I've got to say... James Herbert books are always fairly relentless when it comes to pace. And I think we found that with The Dark as well, didn't we, Miles? Yeah. Even, even though it was uh, a longer book than either The Rats or The Fog, it was still pretty relentless. Domain kicks off part one with what can only be described as a vignette festival of madness. The mother load of it, vignettes. I love it. It is utterly relentless it is 50 pages of vignettes that fill the usual herbert mo i either like mini accounts of general people members of the public i think the best way you can probably imagine it is you remember the lady who pisses herself when the nuclear explosion goes off in sheffield in, at the beginning of threads yeah. each of these vignettes is like let's just spend 10 minutes with this woman in the build-up to her standing there, putting her hand over her mouth and wetting her knickers. And we find a little bit about them. We find a little bit about their reaction to what's going on around them, their response to the abject horror of the air raid sirens going off. And then I, th I think it's not just the air raid sirens. What it captures really fantastically well is the response to the air raid siren and then the response to the silence after the air raid siren shuts down and the fact that people know that they've got 60 to 90 seconds or two minutes before whatever's coming. And I think there are six or seven, aren't there? Each of which is essentially John Smith was on his way to the office. He hated his starch trousers and his wife was a terrible at ironing and he didn't like the smell of her air spray. Oh no, my face has melted. So I'm going to ask you both, what is your favourite? I think for me, it might be Police Constable John <laughs> Mapstone. That's the one I chose as well. <laughs> if, if only because the end, like the last three sentences are like the most quintessentially stereotypically British reaction yeah. to a nuclear explosion hitting you in the face, which is uh, about bloody time. Yeah. That's the so, problem with nuclear bombs. You're waiting for it and then free go off at once. Yeah. So this poor copper, this police constable John Mapstone, I, I laughed out loud at the first paragraph because I thought the morning James Herbert wrote that, maybe maybe <laughs> some local Bobby had upset him or something because it reads, police constable John Mapstone was to remember his fifth day on the force for the rest of his life. He'd always had a bad memory. Fortunately, required educational standards for the force were dropping by the year, but because his life was only to last a few more minutes, this proved to be no handicap. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely brilliant oh dear but then he, do, he does have this really genuinely terrible experience trying to get down into a tube station you get a fantastic description of the madness the panic the people trying to slip down the central reservation and then more people doing it and all just turn into a tangle of crushed bodies and limbs at the bottom it's absolutely fantastic and it's it's relentless it's a page turner he is essentially getting squashed 
and crushed to death and suffocated under mounds and mounds of bodies. And that's what it says, a sound that seemed to rise up from the very bowels of the earth. Oh, yes, he assured himself that would be the bomb about bloody time too. It's just brilliant. Phil, how about you? Well, I actually thought the same. I would have said Jeanette, real name Brenda, but <laughs> we know where that one went. T- tell us about Jeanette, real name Brenda. Well, I think she was a woman of the night. Yeah. <laughs> and she had, was it three? Yes, three it Middle Eastern gentlemen. Middle Eastern gentlemen who took advantage of every orf- orifice. <laughs> So, you know what? Yeah. It's funny you should bring that up, actually, because when we were reading towards the end of the book, I kept thinking to myself, oh, wow. Every time I thought, this James Herbert book is awfully light on sex, there are two occasions where he books that. One, of course, is Jeanette. And we'll get to those bits and pieces in due time. So we have all these accounts. They are absolutely brilliant. And we get a few more like little packs of these mini accounts as well further on. But in the final mini account in this section, after probably about 40 pages of learning about people and their wants and needs and loves and everything else, and then them being melted or incinerated or crushed or shredded by flying glass or crushed by fallen mercenary or a combination of all of those things, we meet Dealey and his saviour a guy called Culver. So Dealey is a civil servant who sees the flash but just gets pulled backwards into a building by somebody. It turns out that this is Culver and Dealey. And Dealey, turns out, is a Ministry of Defence civil servant following a fairly standard pattern of James Herbert having civil servants as protagonists, I thought, at first. But of course, that doesn't turn out to be the case. The guy who serves him turns out to be... Um, the protagonist of the novel. And we get to follow their desperate descent once again into the underground to try and find the way because Blinded Dealey tells Culver that he can get to a shelter, a bunker of some description. So Culver, who we know very little about at this stage, helps this guy Dealey to find his way into the tunnels. And once again, this book, in the first 50 pages, it doesn't waste any time. Panic in the underground station, which I think is Holborn Station. People trying to save themselves, people wetting themselves, people fighting for survival, and then they make their way into the tunnels, and already we've got rats eating people. (laughs) It does not waste any time whatsoever in getting to rats eating people on the underground. We've got poor blind men getting crushed. We've got... it's, It's the works. And at this point, we also meet our female protagonist, because she's in the tunnels. She's one of the people who've fled into the tunnels only to shriek and retreat as rats are eating people. And there's uh, a typically James Herbert bit here where Culver clocks this girl as he's trying to look after Dealey as they're observing rats eating people and burrowing the way into unfortunate dead bodies. And he makes this observation about this woman, and it says, Her face was smeared with blood and dirt, although he could see no open cuts and her eyes remained wide and staring. She might have been pretty, he couldn't tell, and her shoulder-length hair might have looked good with the sun reflecting highlights, but again it was hard to tell, and not the uppermost consideration in his mind. When his hand touched her shoulder, the air exploded with her scream. So, it might not be the uppermost thing in his mind, but he certainly pays enough attention to it to pass mental comment on whether she's fit or not. <laughs> Which is, you know, pr- priorities. Absolutely. But I do think it is worth mentioning that it's quite clear early on that he wants to save other people. And yeah. even, even though Dealey had said, I can take you somewhere safe, he still wanted to stop and help. And I think he just got to the point when he met Kate and it was like, do you know what? Enough of you. I'm saving this one. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And actually, that, that does happen. Th- th- that's mirrored further on, almost at the end, actually. But he comes across as a bit more dense on that occasion. So we've got this terrific setup. We've got death, carnage, destruction. We know that there are, there's a couple of observations that suggest there have been, at the very least, three nuclear strikes on London. We've got the accounts of numerous deaths. We have these um i mean at the end of the day if you're going to have carnage in london you've got to feature the underground in some way right. shape or form haven't you i was mindful of that brilliant scene in life force where the <laughs> one of the male space vampires goes down 
the escalators in, um, I think it's Chancery Lane station and sucks the souls out of all the people on the escalators <laughs> and then goes back up again. It's such a brilliant oh. image. And of course, there's always something about the, you know the underground, the tunnels, the darkness of the tunnels. And of course, mm. that, was, that was exploited in the rats as well, wasn't it? He did that in the rats. He had a scene on the underground. But he does successfully rescue this girl. They find the entrance to the bunker. And then we do get that reprieve from the sheer pace and horror. And that all seemed rather quick. And barring the terrible experience at Holborn Station with the rats in the tunnel, fairly slick. They got where they needed to go. Brilliant. They're in the shelter. But of course, then you look at the book, oh, there's another 400 pages to go yet. So, <laughs> yeah, obviously things are going to go a little bit south. I think you've got two things going on, though, haven't you? Because we saw the rats attacking people in the tunnels, but there's been nuclear explosions. Mm. And everyone's really frightened of the fallout. Yeah. So as yeah. a kick as a kickoff to a Britain is fucked uncozy catastrophe, where does this rank in the books that we've read so far? It's up there, isn't it? Yeah. I definitely. I think it's top over the dark or the fog. I mean, because mm. you know, the dark is definitely more definitely more of a we start small and then escalate out. This is escalating from the word go. And then allows us to kind of contract in to look at just like the smaller conflicts of the characters yeah. before just every so often it's kind of a constant kind of a concertina effect because start large, go small, mm. and then go back out, go back in for a good chunk, you know, good chunk of knowledge that when it goes out, it's the other vignettes of the people outside the shelter. Mm. It slows down a little bit here, but that doesn't mean it's slow no. <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. It does slow down a little bit. And th there's a couple of chapters that follow about the, the bunker. and the, it's, it's a telephone exchange. It's the Kingsway Exchange, isn't it? Which it turns out is manned by telephone engineers for the most part, but there's also a couple of civil defence officers down there. It's part of a communications hub in the event of a nuclear attack. So whilst there's a lot of communications engineers working down there just doing their day jobs and that's how they happen to be down there it's also well stocked it's got stores it's got a medical officer it's got a couple of cdos it's got bunk houses it's got a kitchen it's got coffee machines it's got everything that you would need and we find out quite a few things down there but and this is where i start to really appreciate james Herbert for maybe just doing his own work everything in a james Herbert book always seems super super plausible and we get a really, really good example of that when we've got 39 or so survivors in the Kingsway Exchange come bunker. And they all gather together and they get a talk on casualty projections and a primer on radiation poisoning from Dr. Claire Reynolds. Ah, uh, Dr. Claire. Poor Dr. Claire, as we'll find out. Poor everybody, really, Yeah. at the end of the day. But poor Dr. Claire Reynolds. And we get this, this absolutely brilliant talk. Because, of course, people are jumping around saying, well, we need to get out, we need to get to our families. So it was Dr. Reynolds who calmly brought the room to order. If any of you go out from this shelter now, you'll be dead within a matter of weeks, possibly days. Her voice was raised just as to be heard over the clamour. She too was standing, her hands tucked into the pockets of a rope and white tunic, and it's probably the uniform of her profession that gave her some credibility. She represented the physical antithesis of Dealey, a man who was the puppet of a government that had brought their country to war. Their vehemence towards Dealey may have been unjustified, and most of those present realised this despite their anger, but he was there, one of the faceless bureaucrats within their reach, within striking distance. Dr Reynolds was well aware of whom the rising hysteria was aimed at, and in some respects could understand it, for these shattered people needed something tangible to blame, someone to be held responsible. Dealey, as far as they're concerned, you're it. I can tell you this, she said, the noise beginning to subside. It won't be a pleasant death. First you'll feel nauseous, and your skin will turn red, your mouth and throat inflamed, you won't have much strength. Vomiting will follow, and you'll suffer pretty excruciating diarrhoea for a few days. You may start to feel a little better after this, but I promise you it won't last. All those symptoms are going to return, with a vengeance, and you'll sweat, your skin will blister, and your hair will fall out. You women will find your menstruation cycle will ignore the usual rules. You'll bleed. A lot and badly. You men will have pain in your genitals. If you do survive, which I doubt, you'll be sterile, or worse. The chances are that any offspring will be abnormal. Leukemia will be a disease you'll know all about from a personal point of view. 
Towards the end, your intestines will be blocked. You might find that the worst discomfort of all. Finally, and perhaps mercifully, the convulsions will hit you. And after that, you won't care very much. You'll sink into a brief coma. Then you'll be dead. The eyes behind the large glasses were expressionless. Jesus, thought Culver. She didn't pull the punches. There are other milder results of irradiation if you'd like to hear them. She was coldly relentless, deliberately frightening them into staying. Food won't do you any good. You won't be able to extract essential nourishment. All the tissue in your body will age dramatically. There'll be a contraction of the bladder, burn fractures that won't mend, inflammation of the kidneys, liver, spinal cord and heart, bronchopneumonia, thrombosis, cancer, and aplastic anemia, which will lead you to subcutaneous hemorrhaging. In other words, you'll bleed to death under the skin. And if that isn't enough, you'll have the pleasure of watching others around you dying in the same way, watching the agonies of those in the more advanced stages, witnessing what you, yourself, will soon be going through. So if you want to leave, if you want to expose yourself to all that, knowing you'll be too ill to help others, I don't see why we should stop you. In fact, I'll plead on your behalf to allow you out, because you'll only cause dissension in this shelter. Any takers? She sat when she was sure there wouldn't be. Oh. Thanks, Dr. Oh. Claire. Yeah, thanks, Dr. <laughs> Claire. That was really helpful. <laughs> Blimey. So that's pretty that's that's pretty grim and pretty harsh. But yeah, it's it is like re watching one of those bibi dibi 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 um presentations from uh, a documentary or a public information film. Just a little bit harder, <laughs> a little bit franker and more to the point. It's fantastic. I love it. But I've always you had a little bit leaving. of an obsession. Don't. Yeah. If you're thinking of leaving, yeah, you'll melt and it'll be rubbish and you shit yourself to death. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> But we, we do get our seven kind of established named characters so far, and we do get some others. But so far we've got Dealey, the Ministry of Defence civil servant. We've got Culver, the man who saved Dealey and helped get him to the bunker, who also saved Kate, Kate who they rescued from the rats. We've got Dr Claire Reynolds, resident MO in the bunker. We've got Howard Faraday, senior telephone exchange line manager, and the guy who's kind of de facto in charge of the bunker but doesn't really command much respect from the engineers and the other people down there because he's basically the line manager who's now kind of in charge of the end of the world. We've got Bryce, the civil defence officer. There's another civil defence officer as well, whose name I forget off the top of my head. He's pretty unlucky as well, as we found out later on. And we'll get a few more, most of whom will be rat fodder, but one or, one or two will be a little bit more substantial. And speaking of rat fodder... I think that one is Ellison who is just one of the kind of the one of like this telephone engineer guys who sort of becomes the antagonist you know the antagonist of um Coralist human faction as the yeah. book continues yeah yeah so we get some like rebellious sorts don't we we get Strachan we get Ellison who um has probably the best and most wonderful end of anybody in this book that's right at the very end we'll get to that we come across a couple of more guys when Culver goes out to do some reconnaissance a little bit later we come across Fairbank who's a dude I He's love a real Fairbank. Dude. Me too. Um, but at this point, the bunker folks have a lot on the plate, but Culver decides to pile it on. And this reminded me of that scene from The Young Ones when Rick says, my parents are dead. And Neil says, you think that's bad. And this is exactly what Culver does on page <laughs> 75. Culver had the feeling that however candid Dealer was appearing to be as he listed other sites in and around London, he was holding back, still not telling everything. He mentally shrugged. It would be hard to trust any government man from now on, because of course Deal has just been listing all these other bunkers around and the fact that this is like a communications hub for all these places. And a national seat of government will be set up outside London, and the country divided up into 12 regional seats with 23 sub-regional headquarters. And that reminds us, doesn't it, Phil, of the Warren Bunker part in that brilliant documentary narrated by Paxman that we watched when we did My Experiences in the oh. Third World War. Do you remember <laughs> the, the, the cop trawler? who was like, a, was he an accountant or something, who was absolutely oh. high on being the sub-regional head of um, crisis response. But anyway. The power really went to his head. Yeah. <laughs> was anyone in the room really listening to Daly now? Country and district controls. Did any of it make sense? Sub-district controls, which will liaise with communication posts. Daly. Heads turned to look at Culver. Daly stopped speaking and the telltale tongue flicked across his lips. Have you told anybody about the creatures out there? Culver's voice was level, but there was a tightness to it. Kate beside him stiffened. I hardly think it need worry. 
It's got to worry us, Dealey, because sooner or later we've got to go out there into those tunnels. The main entrance is blocked, remember? The tunnels are our only way out. Uh, I doubt they'll stay underground. They'll scavenge for food, on the surface. And in that case, they'll die from radiation poisoning. Culver smiled grimly. I don't think you've been doing your homework. Faraday broke in. What's he talking about? What are these creatures? This time it was Dr. Reynolds who spoke. She removed her glasses and polished them with a small handkerchief. Dealey, Culver and Miss Garner were attacked by rats outside this shelter. It appears they were particularly large and, to say the least, unusually ferocious. They had attacked and were devouring survivors who had taken shelter in the tunnels. Faraday frowned and looked back at Culver. Just how large were they? Culver opened his arms like a burstful fisherman. Like dogs, he replied. More silence, more stunned dismay. There will be no threat to us, Dealey insisted. By the time we leave the shelter, most of these vermin will be dead. Culver shook his head and Dr. Reynolds answered. You really should have known this, Mr. Dealey. Or perhaps you wanted to forget. You see, certain forms of life are highly resistant to radiation. Insects are, for instance, and so too are rats. She replaced the spectacles. And, she continued, almost in a sigh, if these creatures are descendants of the black rats that terrorised London just a few years ago, and from their size I'd say they were, and not only will they be resistant to radiation, but they'll thrive on it. Oh, good lord. So this is a real fucking double whammy for these poor fuckers in this bunker. She knows how to give the good news. She really does. So, yeah, what a bummer. I mean, what, what a situation to be in. Now, chapter 7, we get an interlude, and we get the sad story of the Climptons. And when I read this, I thought, this is just like the family in Threads the family who get into their inner sanctum, right down to the fact that Granny's died and they've got her covered up by a curtain and the dog's outside howling and wanting to be let in. So it's just like Threat the Family and Threads, except they all get eaten by rats. <laughs> Poor Clintons. So when, when did Threads come out? Threads, I think, was 1983. This is 1984. Okay. Yeah. Right in this, right at the height of all that stuff. We've had Threads, we've had that mm. QED documentary, we've had the Arena documentary, um, the, the wonderful QED documentary that matter-of-factly tells you just how pointless it is building a shelter in your garden if you live in certain bands of, of geography in London. It's incredible. Uh, the poor Clintons. But we're going to talk about James Herbert's progression here a little bit because Chapter 8 holds something of a surprise where we have Kate and Dr. Reynolds, Dr. Claire Reynolds, two female characters having an extended conversation for several pages. I'm not sure it would pass the Bechdel test because Kate largely talks mostly about Culver, but it is some form of growth. In Herbert's progression in the last 10 or 11 years since he wrote The Rats, I think he's come on quite a lot. All I've read of Herbert has been The Fog, The Dark, the Rats Lair, which I read concurrently with this, mm. and Haunted, mm. which was a cracking read. Let's mm. have a look. Okay. Yeah, ha Haunted is just a really good ghost story, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. No, so, you know, admittedly, like, even with reading Lair, I was really surprised, yes, you know, in comparison to The Rats, where you have, um, you have the world's most hateful geography teacher who's openly <laughs> leering yeah. at the yeah. students. Yeah, school children, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, although Blair's, you know, gives me my favorite character, which is the um the PE teacher Flasher. <laughs> <laughs> Who just kept reminding me of, of of Principal Skinner from The Simpsons. Yeah. But no, I'm just surprised as to hear how much growth I've been. You know, even with like a book like The Dark, where the women still felt like you know, were part of the story, but still felt like the token woman who's the other because, you know, men will always see women as the yeah. other, in that very kind of Garth Marenghi kind of way. Hmm. We had the hatchet-faced cultist women in the dark, <laughs> didn't we, as well, who were yeah. basically just thinly drawn villains. What about you, Phil? From the rats, through the fog, and onto this, do you think his female characters have got a little bit more development, perhaps? Definitely so. I mean, there are bits throughout the book, and we'll come to it later on, where I'm like, ugh. <laughs> I know what you're thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. What I'm thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> but there is definitely improvement, and I love Dr. Reynolds, and I liked that relationship. Until her thoughts were we going to her head a bit later on. But yeah. I did like her relationship with Kate. Yeah. Whilst I applaud him for some of this development, there are a couple of things in this book that really made me 
almost want to cry out with, with despair, which aren't about female characters, but we'll get to that as well in good yeah. time. I was thinking just yeah. the same. So we do learn a couple of things actually about Culver over this chapter as well. We find out that when he was sedated and delirious, he cried out that he couldn't save her. The water got her. And I've got to say, when we actually find out what that is in reference to, <laughs> yeah, not convinced. But also yeah. he's a helicopter pilot. And that might actually be related to the first point, as we'll find out later on. Did you ever watch Survivors? With um, oh, yeah. Ian McCulloch. With Ian McCulloch, yeah. Yeah. Lo- loved the first season. Oh, yeah. That's the only one I've seen. Oh, don't watch I, anymore. I heard, it, I heard it dropped off after the first season. Yeah, don't watch any more. The The really fantastic female character in it leaves after the first mm. season. I think apparently in real life she had quite severe alcohol issues and she left the series and at that point Ian McCulloch kind of steps up and wants to be the man behind the scenes. He's asking to direct episodes. And the second series, whilst not as good as the first, is still okay, but it kind of goes downhill. The third series, I think it's, I'm just thinking from memory, the third series is basically like Emmerdale Farm without petrol. It's really, really terrible. Yeah. But I really love the first series. I love that, like, degradation of society. Yeah, that's always the best stuff, isn't it? It's like in zombie yeah. films. The best bits in zombie films are whilst society is collapsing. Day of the Triffids. Day of the Triffids, yeah. Fantastic. All that stuff is brilliant. Once it settles into... I'll just go into the garden and get a cabbage. Or, oh no, we need some baby bio. I'll go into the local village and see <laughs> if I can find some. You know, but yeah, it all, it all gets a bit lame. With the exception probably of Day of the Dead, because I think they managed to translate that degradation of society into it just happens amongst the characters and the people instead. I absolutely love Day of the Dead. We like Day of the Dead, don't we, Phil? We do. Like David Dead. I'm running this monkey's farm, Frankenstein, and I want to know what the fuck you're doing with my time. Absolutely love that film. Joe Pilato is just amazing in that film. <laughs> I haven't I haven't watched that one in the longest time, but I love I love it has a really fantastic soundtrack, which I use a lot for mood music when writing that and the yeah. golden soundtrack for Dawn of the Dead, which is uh mwah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. We'll get to Italian soundtracks later on as well, because <laughs> you, can't, you, can't beat a go- you can't beat a goblin soundtrack, can you? No. Yeah. So meanwhile, Dealey's sight is recovered because, of course, he was blinded by the flash. Can I just put in before you go any further, just because we just mentioned it? Yeah. So we've just gone through this lovely conversation with Kate and the Doctor, and then Dr. Claire goes to Culver as he wakes up, and one of James's first lines when he says to him that, she said, at one point, you were the colour of a Chinaman. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that. M- maybe I just suppressed the memory. Yeah. Meanwhile. Meanwhile. <laughs> yeah. Dealey's sight is recovered. He and the other senior officials are fearing an insurrection from within, from the telephone exchange workers, two of whom have already attempted suicide. And there are still no communications available with any of the bunkers, so they intend to send a party out to reach the main government shelter under embankment and they want Culver to go along. But there are a couple of other things we've picked up on as well. Culver has this sense that Dealey knows more about the rats than he's letting on. And the other thing is, we find out that because a couple of them sustain bites from the rats, and we know from the previous rats books that the rats carry a pretty horrendous disease, our friend Dr. Claire Reynolds has got drugs to treat these rat bite conditions as standard medication. So Culver's pretty suspicious because he thinks, right, hang on. If these rats were wiped out years ago, why is this stuff standard in government bunkers? Do they know something that we don't? So that'll that'll come back into play as well. But that is essentially end of part one. Book split into three parts. First part is the advent. And before we go into part two, aftermath, I just had some thoughts about it. It's like, I've already mentioned that I really appreciate that he seems to have done his own work. And Dr. Reynolds, when she's talking to Kate she, and, and about the disease impact for the post-bomb period, it all feels really detailed and authentic. Faraday's explanation of the post-attack governance structure for the autonomous regions and command and control, we know is really accurate because we probably watched the same QED that James Herbert watched when he was writing this book. And it's gripping, it's thrilling, it's plausible, it's great stuff, and 
even though we have the um the sex worker character early on in the book who of course gets melted there's not an awkward or weird or disturbing sex scene in sight which is quite impressive for a james herbert book of course at this stage 300 plus more pages to go so plenty of time yet so that sense of satisfaction may well backfire so we move on to part two aftermath and uh, uh, <laughs> oh. Sorry, and, what were you just saying? <laughs> yeah, and, and within a couple of pages we get the words dribbling penis on her belly. Oh yeah. good lord. This so, is within the cinema, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Chapter ten is a rough one. It is. Uh, it's gotta be said. It's a lot of survivors trapped under a collapsed building with a limited amount of light, and a poor woman goes to the toilet in the darkness, gets followed. Ends up with a dribbling penis on her belly. And everybody gets eaten by rats, fortunately, so we don't have to suffer through any more of that. I, I do have to give this chapter one bit. Is that what, you know, the lady, Sharon, is being attacked and assaulted, but she does decide, I'm not going to, even if it's, if it's the apocalypse, I'm not going to fucking take it. Yeah. And then gouges the guy's eye out <laughs> with her thumb. <laughs> yeah, Which is the point I have to kind of put the book down. Yeah. Turn to my wife and go, you'll appreciate this. <laughs> Did she? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and of course, then eaten by rats. Yeah. But I just love lying there with, with, with so many hundreds of millions dead. Why should her single feeble body be sacrosanct? The answer was obvious. And she knew it before the question was really begged. Because it was hers. They could kill off the whole fucking world, but her body belonged to her. So again, it's. I feel with Herbert, it's, it's kind of been two steps forward, then a step and a half back. Yeah. Every yeah. time. It's a shame that it, it's a, she it is a sh it's... Ass, it didn't go ahead. Yeah. It yeah. just got it eaten. Yeah. I suppose there is something about these these stories as well. It, it, is, it is pulp. It's, it's horror. Yeah. There is a sense of satisfaction that you can get as a reader when someone fights back and gouges the rapist's mm. eye out with her thumb. It's just a shame that they it, then get eaten by rats for their yeah. efforts. Yeah. It doesn't feel as misanthropic as The Fog does. No, that's true. I think Herbert is saving his real misstep for something other than sexual politics or sexual scenarios or sexual violence. And yeah, that's further down the line, yeah. But... Chapter 11 details Culver's expedition through the tunnels with Fairbank the Engineer, who we love. Uh -huh. The other CDO, uh, the other guy is McEwen and CDO Bryce, and they have a horrendous experience going back into Holborn Station because the station platform, the escalators, the ticket area, a one big charnel house of unfortunate survivors that made it below ground, only to be fallen upon and utterly mutilated by the rats and it's really quite harrowing their journey as, as harrowing as anything else it is in this book i mean this book is just one fucking harrowing experience after another from start to finish and i, I do think to some extent this is probably one of the things that desensitized me to these kind of things when i read it when i was 12 but yeah it's pretty it's pretty fucking horrendous reading it again at 51 we do get some some fact finding throughout this period as well, don't we? Because Culver learns a thing or two. They find dead rats, number one, that have had the skulls bashed in, so people have managed to fight back and kill kill the rats. But something else that only he and Bryce clock fully, and it's referenced, but it's not revealed to us as readers just yet, and this is something that comes into play much further on in the book. And then chapters 12, 13, 14 are all about the ruined city, the terrifying encounter with irradiated survivors, which is almost like something out of a, a zombie movie. Or um, is it is it Bryce whose fingers get eaten by a rabid dog? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Bryce decides to go and pet a dog, and it eats his fingers. <laughs> and on return to the tunnels, the flooded nightmare. It's all going on again. I know we're skipping over this because it's such a long book, and we we'll, we we'll, we'll, might be here all night otherwise. But it's all going on. It's gripping. Poor McEwen gets swept away, and after struggling the way back to the bunker. It turns out that the thing that the leaders feared has taken place has been an insurrection. Those bloody telephone engineers have taken over the bunker. 
I, yeah, I just wanted to take us back a little bit, and I know was, there's a lot to get through, but I forgot later on that Fairbank had such a dark sense of humour. Do you remember the bit with the woman on the escalator with her insides out, and he went, that was a ride she won't have enjoyed? <laughs> yeah. Bits. I think Fairbank is is one of the best developed characters in this book because he has such a... Number one, is pretty heroic, and number two... He actually has this sense of humor in this. He's got a personality in a way that yeah. some of the most of the rest of the characters in the book just simply don't have. He's kind of like you know he you know where like um, Culver and Dealey are very kind of the, the square jawed hero mm. and like the the duplicitous secret um, civil servant. He he's kind of like the book Digby, where you just have him you just pan over to him yeah. just to have Fairback give a one liner. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was. I say the, the bit you missed that the shelters weren't just built for nuclear warfare, but also for a civil insurrection or coup d'état. Yeah, unfortunately, the, the coup d'état is coming from inside the bunker. Yeah. So daily has been deposed by a force, by a collective that want to run things democratically, democratically by stealing guns. Bloody lefties. Yeah, do it all at the point at the point <laughs> of a stick. Oh, oh at least they they aren't um secret Soviet agents like that <laughs> one mp in uh in the crabs yeah that was amazing <laughs> that was absolutely amazing but they want to run things democratically and they want to leave the bunker sorry go on phil i was just gonna say is this the point where ellison finds his love of guns no that's that's yeah. that's just a few pages down the line after the shit oh. hits the fan isn't it but yes ellison has a real hard on for a sterling submachine gun <laughs> we find yeah so they've got this collective who want to run things democratically. They want to leave the bunker. But, of course, Culver says, yeah, no, you don't want to do that. And he gives an account of their expedition that gives them serious pause for thought. We also learn that, again, the doctor, our friend Dr. Reynolds, has strong suspicions that the people who stocked the bunker knew the mutant rats would be an issue, as those medical supplies include mitigation specifically for dealing with complications they may cause. And she challenges Dealey with this, but he, he denies any knowledge of it. And finally, we find out what Culver and Fairbank clocked. Many of the bodies in the station were missing heads. Mm, how peculiar. There are also references to the prior two outbreaks of mutant rat action. The first, of course, being the scientist was Chiller and his breeding experiments, which we found out about in the rats. He was breeding these rats that had been irradiated and mutated in his weird little fucking house by a canal in London, and the second being the outbreak in Epping Forest that, of course, was the subject of the second Rats novel, Lair. Now, I know when we said we were going to cover this, Miles, I said we were going to read Lair as well, just to fill in the gaps between the two. Yeah. But we couldn't find our second copy of Lair, and Ooh. I left it with Phil, and she never got round to reading it, and we both only finished Apologies. reading... Yeah, we had both only finished reading Domain today. So I haven't still haven't read Lair for 35 or more years, Quick recap of Lair for our benefit. Okay, rats, you thought they were bad enough in the city. Now they're in the forest. <laughs> that's it's, it's pretty much it. Um, there's a rat kill organization, kind of like a unit for rats, who just kind of go around like taking care of any kind of rat outbreaks that could happen. It's kind of more the same, similar to the rats than Domain. Yeah. You get the vignettes, you get the... um. The flasher PE teacher who's best character. And of course, you have a love triangle which goes off the worst possible time when the rival, the the male rival, starts trying to have the fight, the climactic fight with our hero in the middle of the rat's lair itself. And of course, ends with him being taken out of the picture by being bodily devoured. Huh. Well, that's quite it's, quite convenient for our protagonist, isn't it? All very convenient. I mean, okay, yeah. she was never going to date him, but now he's been eaten by rats. She's definitely not going to date him. Yeah. Now, I know, more than remembering this from reading it 35-odd years ago, more from the cover, that Lair introduces the two-headed... It doesn't introduce it, because I think the two-headed rat is referenced right at the very end of the rats isn't it? Right right in the yeah. italicised like coda at the end of the rats. But do we get any kind of development as to this two-headed queen rat in Lair? Not really. It's just it's just hanging out in the Lair. It's um, just there. Giving, it's just there to have like your big shock ending number. Yeah. 
okay. no, it's 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 good and fun. You know, it's it's what it is. It, it's what it advertises under ten. Yeah. Right, I'm I'm quickly going to pass comment on this field recordings barrel edge stout at 11%. Surprisingly palatable. Wow. We've had some genuinely horrific stouts and porters that have been over 10%. This one, pretty good. So yeah, enjoyed that. What's the rating on your pumpkin beer? My pumpkin beer rating was 8.6, and I can definitely feel it. Yeah. Um, my second beer in the evening... Is a amber is Ambergeddon amber ale, which is six point seven. Yeah. And was the pumpkin beer nice? More to yes. the point. Good. Surprisingly so. Yeah, good. I'm going now with one that Phil got, which is Loiter Bock beer, and I'm going to try and read the back, but the writing is fucking tiny. <laughs> um. A high fermentation ruby red beer enhanced with secondary fermentation. You enjoy the flavour of roasted malt with a slightly sweet note of caramel. The beer is served in a special tumble glass with its own wooden base. Not in my case, it isn't. Maybe if you drink it in some posh craft beer joint, but I'm drinking it out of a glass. And this one is 7.5%. So let's give it a go. This Ambergen is also local to me. Brewed in Madison, Wisconsin and fermented insanity. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. The Ale Asylum. Sounds bold. Of course. Oh, yeah, it has a nice uh, can with skull and two guns. Nice. Mine's got a mightily horned goat on it. <laughs> so, right, Culver and Fairbank go to bed, but to no avail, because this book can't sit still for five fucking minutes. The bunker floods with not only water, but rats as well. <laughs> but just before that starts, can I just say this is where we get a two-page view of what's in Dr. Claire's head about ah. her husband, about finding Claire somebody really good to talk to, how they could be friends and she would also perhaps like a physical relationship yep. but she doesn't think Kate will go for that. Yep, and also in a way the bunker flooding with water and rats is a good thing for Dr. Claire initially because it interrupts her musing on her nightmares about her dead husband is Willie and oh, her lack, yeah. oh yeah, it's Willie. And her yeah. lack of even a bit of, sorry, checks notes, secret moistness. <laughs> yes, secret moistness. At least it's not a moist triangle. It's not a moist triangle. It is. It's. I, it's more secretive than that. I. I love her. I love how. Can I just, can I just read the section where she describes the relationship between her husband and herself. The relationship between Simon and herself had been fulfilling on many levels, aesthetically and physically. He had never been a marvelous lover in certain terms, never a super stud, Sman, but he had been consistent and warming and rarely, hardly ever selfish. Their mutual professions were exhausting and demanding and all-consuming, hence the lack of little Reynoldses. But they had their moments together, and oh, such wonderful giving moments. She had enjoyed their sex. But in the days, the weeks following the disaster, she had not even thought of her physical needs, for nothing had stirred inside, not even in the loneliness of the sleepless nights. No hunger had caused any secret moistening, no breast tingle, except in the dreams, in the nightmares. Now, I've got to say, this, this is an expression I can't say I've ever heard before. But when she says, he'd never been a super stud, a coxman, a coxman? I've never heard Simon, that expression before. It sounds like a sports term. It does. It, it sounds like someone, like you know, someone you know, you get a, you need a coxman for a game of cricket. Yeah, or or it's like a certain position in a fucking boat race. So, or boat something. Race. Yeah, absolutely bizarre. A coxman, and then it goes on, doesn't it? It says, "When a dead husband had come for her, raised his skeletal hand to take hers. His body was burnt away. The parts not seared from his bones, eaten by the squirming things that moved around inside him. Nothing left." Except his genitals, the proud and erect penis that pushed from the tattered clothing and was the only part of him that was alive, that was not gristle, was not bitten into, oh. the only part that throbbed with pulsing, life-giving blood. And maybe at that point she was in need of some satisfaction. <laughs> well, you know what? She didn't get it, did she? Mm. <laughs> she didn't get it. She got chomped on by rats and then machine-gunned by Ellison. So this guy, Ellison, who we've not heard of before, 
who suddenly pops into the story, who's one of Strachan's lot, who've got guns. He's got a major hard-on for his Sterling submachine gun. He's shooting rats, and while Culver's trying to save her from the flood water, while she's got a rat on her back chomping down into the top of her neck, she just gets riddled with bullets. <laughs> he goes all American. <laughs> Poor Claire. Poor Claire. <laughs> Yeah, I won't bring politics into it at all. Yeah. But yeah, he loves <laughs> that gun. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. He's it's certainly uh, for a guy who is basically a telephone engineer, this yeah. is a fucking <laughs> this is a dream come true for this guy to be stood there legs akimbo with a submachine gun <laughs> spraying wildly. He probably yeah. thought, why didn't I get one earlier? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the apocalypse is great. I get a gun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's free. <laughs> yeah. It's free. He's probably just shouting, ah, while yeah. he fires the gun just in any direction. <laughs> Bit Rambo. <laughs> yeah. We also find out what happens to poor Bryce as well. Culver and Kate are gutted that they've just seen Dr. Claire Reynolds machine gunned by Dopey Ellison. Delia's explained there's an alternative way out and they're going to try and get to it. And then we get the perspective from Bryce who's laid up in the infirmary. Poor Bryce, who is... He's got his fingers, fingers bitten off by a rabid dog. It only really gets worse for him <laughs> from that point onwards because Dr. Claire is giving him the rabies treatment. When we were kids, I don't know if you remember this, Phil. How, are, you, are you of our age, Miles, or are you a lot younger than us? I suspect you're a lot younger than us, given that I'm, your I'm hair 40. is still... Yeah, yeah. A so, lot younger. A lot younger, yeah. So, you know, we're in our 50s, and... I remember when I was a youngster, the rabies threat was like a really heavy thing. You'd get adverts on TV for rabies, and you'd get little posters for rabies in post offices and things like that. And I remember, I can't remember how I found out, but I remember hearing that the treatment was brutal. I think my mum was a nurse, right? So mum was a nurse. She worked at Castle Hill Hospital. I think mum might have explained to me what the treatment for rabies was, and it was it was injections in your stomach repeatedly over a period of time they were brutally painful well we get we get this description of bryce's experience and and i gotta say it sounds pretty rough so for bryce the reality was more horrendous than any nightmare he had ever known he had come to after his sedation with the full knowledge that the disease had him it was too soon for the full symptoms to be evident but the dryness in his throat the feeling of burning up inside and the fierce headache were the indications and the forerunners of the agony to follow in a few days' time, there would be agitation, confusion, and hallucinations. Then muscle spasms, stiffness of the neck and back, convulsions, and perhaps even paralysis. He knew the symptoms. Civil defence staff were made aware of them in their training, and he dreaded the inevitable pain he was promised. He would not be able to drink, and the inability to swallow properly would cause him to foam at the mouth, to be mortally afraid of liquids, to be terrified of his own saliva. The fits, the madness, would eventually lead him into a coma, a pain-filled exhaustion, and mercifully, death would come soon after. His right hand was numb at the moment, but the memory of Reynolds' quickly administered treatment sent fresh nausea sweeping through him. After injecting him against the pain, she had squeezed the stump of his fingers, encouraging them to bleed a little more. Then, using a syringe, she had forced benzylconium, an antiseptic detergent, into the open wounds, after which, and despite his moaning protests, she had carefully applied a small amount of nitric acid. He was weeping by the time she injected the antiserum around the wounds, and ready to collapse when a further dose was injected into a muscle in his wrist. And he was pleading by the time she had administered the vaccination, puncturing the side of the abdomen below the ribs 14, 15, 16. He lost count after 17 times, quietly explaining to him that the treatment was absolutely vital if he were to survive, ignoring his protests which grew more desperate, yet more feeble, each time the needle pierced his skin telling him that each two mil subcutaneous injection was an attenuated virus prepared from the brains of rabid animals, as if he really cared. When Dr. Reynolds was through, Bryce really couldn't care less about anything, anyone, or himself even. He had swooned back onto the bunk bed and sunk into sweet oblivion. Oh, blimey. That sounds pretty horrendous, doesn't it? So all That's those like, ideas I had about what rabid treatment was... There they are, explained in full. And I'm guessing James Herbert had done his own work on this as well. It sounds pretty fucking horrendous. Squeezing mm. those stub, finger stubs on the blade oh, mm. and then stick needles in. 
Oh, sounds That's awful, cruel. doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, but you know what? To cut a long story short, if Ed almost gets drowned, which he submits to because he's so much pain, oh, and he thinks, yeah. "Oh yeah, I'll just let myself go to it," but then someone saves him, only for him to then get blown up and then drowned again anyway. He has an awful ending. Yeah, you can't catch a break, can he? Anyway, once again, to stop us being here probably till next Tuesday. <laughs> They do get out anyway, but not before more breathless rat action does for a few more of the bunker peeps. Kate, Culver, Dealey, Fairbank, they make it with a few others, one of whom is a black engineer called Jackson. Jackson. I like Jackson. Mm. Well, more on Jackson later. <laughs> yeah. And then we get to part three. So, well, we're doing pretty well. We're doing pretty well. We've got uh, two thirds of the way through our book already. Good times. I have to say, I love the first vignette. I really do. Oh, it is brilliant. Because, we, we do, of course, we don't head straight back to Culver and Co. at this point, do we? And I have to say, you, you, we've given Herbert some props. We've given him some respect. And you have to give him more respect for having so many ideas in his head. How to articulate human torment. And by gum, he's going to indulge him. He is going to indulge him to the maximum in this book. And, of course, we get three more vignettes before we get back to the main thrust of the story. So, Phil, tell us about this unnamed woman. The first woman is... So she's putting a kettle on the stove, and it's a cold stove. Yeah. So you go, OK, where's this going? And she's got her family at the breakfast table. So she's telling off her husband, uh, telling the son to eat his breakfast, having a go at a daughter for having a doll at the table. But then there's little things like the son is tied to his chair and you learn very quickly that they're all dead other than her. Yeah. And she she's eating mouldy bread where she yeah. wipes away the mould. Yeah. It's very grim. It's grim. It's also incredibly sad yeah. because you have this unnamed woman dying of radiation poisoning because it explains how, how ill she is. She's dealing with her trauma by keeping her dead family at the dinner table and living inside a delusion of normality. And the way it ends, it says, The woman glanced towards the shattered window, a warm breeze ruffling the thin hair straggling over her forehead. She saw but did not perceive the nuclear-wasted city outside. Her attention drifted back to her family once more and she watched the black fly, which had fully explored the surface of her husband's face by now, disappearing into the gaping hole of his mouth. She frowned, and then she sighed. Oh, Barry, she said. You're not just going to sit there all day again, are you? Tiny, glistening tear beads formed in the corners of each eye, one brimming over, leaving a, a jerky silver trail down to her chin. Her family didn't even notice. Oh. Oh, yeah. that that's up there with Pigeon Lady in in the fog for me as being so brutally sad and awful. Oh, yeah. And like um, you say, she's dying, but you know she's quite early on. Yeah. And you know that yeah. she's going to get a lot worse. Yeah, she's got a way to go yet in yeah. this torment. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah, it's so sad. And then, um, Miles, we have this Morris. sad divorcee. Morris and his Morris shoulder. in the boggy. <laughs> yeah. This prick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Morris J. Kelp, insurance agent, divorcee, Luna, Dreamweaver, writer. Um <laughs> built him built himself his own fallout shelter from a kit, 350 pounds, second hand, 1980s money. Personal radiation meter. One hundred and forty four one hundred and forty five dollars plus twenty one seventy five VAT and survived the apocalypse and he, he's just enjoying it just so he can have one over on his dead neighbors who all laughed at him. Except now he has this cat who he befriended. And he hated cats and the cat hated him. And it just it just goes on that he's slowly getting fond of the cat. And then he ends up killing. He ends up killing her, and stuck in the shelter with the one thing he may have grown to care and love for, but still deep down kind of hates. What I love about that is, at one point, it, it says something along the lines of, "Even this cat couldn't bear to live with him for long." 
Did it was... the cat get rabies? No, I don't think so. Was it just claustrophobic? What happened towards the end to that cat? It's just, just claustrophobic, and he, he gets irritated with it because it keeps breaking into the food. And he keeps, um, he keeps hitting it and hitting it really hard, and the cat just yeah. retaliates. Yeah, they essentially go to war with each other, and <laughs> then at the point where he thinks I can't stay in here any longer with the smell of this rotting cat, he decides to try and get out, but the, but his house collapses on top. <laughs> Off top of his shelter. How awful and he is can't that? get out and he suffocates. Because <laughs> his own house yeah. fell on it. So these last two like these last two little accounts of, of despair, neither of them involve rats. It's just the, the, the sheer awfulness of of this overwhelming situation. And, and then there's one in the hotel, isn't there? Then we get the third one, which does inc- involve rats, of course. We get this group of unnamed survivors still alive in a banqueting hall under a collapsed hotel who are really just managing to shag in the dark, just about survive dysentery, and they finally look close to tunnelling out, only to let in the bloody rats. James Herbert is hard to beat when it comes to... If you, if you want someone to describe the abject horror of dying in the dark and in horrible situations. This is it. Only when their very flesh was being shredded by flailing teeth and claws did they fully realise that vermin were to be their final adversity. Not radiation poisoning, not disease, not hunger, and not despair. They hid, but the rats sought them out. They barricaded themselves behind upturned tables and chairs, and the vermin squirmed their way through. The kitchens offered no refuge, and those who hid in store cupboards only prolonged the waiting lengthened the torment as razor-sharp incisors gnawed away the barriers. Those who escaped into the walk-in freezer store with his rancid meat might have found some protection had not others belatedly tried to gain entry, pulling open the big metal door and allowing their attackers to storm through. One elderly man hid inside an oven, cramming his body in, pulling the door closed, holding onto it for dear life, panting and sobbing, legs drawn up in fetal position. Unfortunately for him, the enemy was within. His old heart had given warning twice in the past and it finally lost patience with its host who would not avoid excitement. The old man suffered an undignified death, stuffed in an oven, now his coffin, his feet and arms feebly beating at the iron walls. An elderly woman pushed open the double doors to the bar, the stench of the more recently dead of no concern, and slammed them shut behind her. She stood alone in the total darkness with her back to the doors, listening to the frightening noises outside her frail legs barely able to hold her weight. A bump against the door made her start. Something slid down the other side, more bumping at the base of the doors, as though someone was struggling there. The woman stumbled away, hands groping the blackness, heading for the mound of old and new deceased who were wrapped in tablecloth shrouds. She fell against something, and her probing hands found the nose, an open mouth of an upturned face beneath its thin covering of cloth. She crawled onto the pile of bodies, burrowing down, pulling them around her, flinching as cold hands brushed her arms, as rigid lips kissed her cheek, as the receptive cadavers crowded in on her, hugging her close as if to steal her warmth. Like the corpses, she tried not to breathe lest the sound give her away, but it seemed that her heart beat loud enough for them all. Encased in the stifling bundles she waited, silently mouthing prayers not remembered since childhood, corpses tight around her as if conspiring to keep her hidden. She might well have eluded the attention of the predators, had not other fugitives burst through the doors. The voracious rats quickly overwhelmed them, dragging them to their knees. The concealed woman tried to close her mind to the shrieks. A quietness eventually fell. Most of the people had been swiftly killed. Those still alive could only moan helplessly as the vermin fed. The woman thought she was safe, until she heard the rummaging among the mound of corpses in which she lay, the scrabbling of claws, strange childlike sounds, weight shifted around her. Something nuzzled against the loose fat above her hip. Something began nibbling at the side of her neck. That's all genuinely horrible, isn't it? Mm. Oh, good Lord. We're spared any more of this. We're spared any more upset, any tears over sad ladies in houses, and we head back to Culver and Co. And we find out a couple of things. One is, they got out, the survivors of the Kingsway Exchange, are resting in a park. And Culver is tortured by guilt over a helicopter crash that kills several men in the North Sea. And it turns out that when he was delirious and he talked about not being able to save her and she sank, he was on about a fucking helicopter. 
he loved his planes and his helicopters. Well, you know, he might have loved his helicopters, but I think we find perhaps James Herbert's weakness here, where we get some extensive character dialogue, where Culver has described his feelings around the crash to Kate, who was having, a, to be fair, he's having a nice little snuggle with, and they keep teasing, they keep teasing some snuggles. And what I really appreciate is that Herbert doesn't go down the track of, I don't know, doing the Rex fingering thing from crabs on the rampage or anything yeah. like that or, or any moist triangle action they're just they, they do just have genuine moments together and and they become more and more intimate without ever quite getting there but there's the, there's there's an exchange there so he's telling her and he's when when she's trying to comfort him he's, he's getting a little bit spiky and he says i'm sorry he said i know what you're trying to do and i'm not mocking i'd even go as far to say i'm grateful but just telling you about it has already helped it's as if I've let something go, set those memories free. Maybe I was the jailer of my own memories all this time, when all they wanted was to be set loose. And what you said about this world destruction is partly true. It doesn't minimise what's happened on that day, but it kind of overshadows it. She relaxed against him. Haven't you spoken about the accident to anyone else before? A couple of people, Harry for one, usually in drinking sessions. Was the other person a woman? No, as a matter of fact, it was a doctor, not a shrink, just an ordinary GP. You want to hear about it? She nodded against his shoulder. About a year after the accident, I developed sore testicles. At least, that's what it felt like to me. You can smile, but when that happens to a man, he fears the worst. I let it ride for a while, but it got no better. Finally, I went to see my doctor and he diagnosed an inflamed prostate and said it was due to stress. I offered that flying was a stressful occupation, but he was smarter than that. He explained that after the helicopter went down and all those lives had been lost, I'd kept my emotions in check and never allowed the breakdown that should have naturally followed. Not necessarily a huge hysterical breakdown, you understand, but perhaps a brief nervous collapse. I hadn't allowed it and the body won't be fooled. The inflamed prostate was a physical manifestation substituted for a mental one. The damage wasn't permanent, just a little bit uncomfortable for a while. And eventually it passed. That's, that's pure dark place dialogue. It's... It's madness, isn't it? It's who talks like that? Now I can forgive Guy and Smith dialogue getting like that because it it kind of fits with a whole slam bam rampage in hundred and forty pages of it's, craziness. It's it's very much man's man dialogue. It, it's like it's tough guy dialogue. No actual emotions. No kind of deep trauma of the soul. It's I've got sore testicles, <laughs> maybe an inflamed prostate. Yeah, but that's because I was so torn up inside. Yeah, by those men I let die. Maybe I was the jailer of my own memories when all they wanted to be was let loose. Oh, and I had a problem oh. with my balls. Well, this is it. I mean, he didn't just lose the helicopter. There was a <laughs> loss of life. So... Oh yeah, all, all that. Yeah, cool. All that cool. Yeah, fine. Yeah. but nobody <laughs> talks like this. <laughs> what warning? Psychological guilt may lead to sore testicles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. So so this chapter, because of all this, is the slowest and most excruciating thing in the whole book. But fortunately, it's only a few pages. Much like, I suppose, a Michael Mocock book. Hey, fuck it. Let's reference Mocock. Much like a Michael Mocock book, even if you get to a point where you just think, yeah, this isn't working for me, it only lasts two pages and then you get mm. back into the stuff that does. But so it we... was interesting for Dealey's Dreams. Yeah. They were interesting. Oh, yeah. All that was pretty good. Yeah, De Dealey's Dream is great because, of course, Dealey has his, has his dream after Culver has his tete-a-tete -tete with him, doesn't he? Yeah. Culver gets a little bit forceful with him. So who have we got left now? We've got seven people left from, from the Kingsway Exchange. We've got Culver. We've got Kate, we've got Dealey, the civil servant, we've got Fairbank, the plucky engineer, who I grew to love more and more as the book goes on. We've got Ellison, he's still alive, the slayer of Dr. Claire Reynolds. Jackson. We've got Jackson, all of whom we know about Jackson is he um, He helps them get out and he's black. And he's an engineer, isn't More he? to come on that. And we've got Dean, who is basically Dean. only described as young. Dean is an engineer. Stocky. Dean's and he's, yeah, stocky, stocky and young. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So after he sets them all to foraging, Culver has this forceful tete-a-tete -tete with Dealey. We don't really immediately find out what's going down, but we do get this brilliant Dealey. We get a Dealey point of view. We get a Dealey POV section in Chapter 22. He's sulking, though, because he's miffed and put out at his interrogation by Culver. 
he still thinks quite forcefully that he's in the right and he's been doing the right thing for everybody. The book is taking great pains to set Dealey up as suspicious and probably conniving. But actually, you know, Dealey turns out quite well in the end. He's just is a civil servant who's doing what he he's, thinks he needs to do. Yeah. yeah. We do what get he's this been told to do. Yeah, we do get this great dream. Is he at a wedding or something with all his family and they all end up like with rat incisors and they all end up eating him? Yeah. I know, I know there's his wife there and she Yeah, basically everybody he knows is is, is some kind of party or wedding, but they all end up like with, with rat teeth and they all end up eating him and then he wakes up. But then their choice of camping out with a fire and booze, because when they went foraging, they were really successful. They found food, tinned food. They found a couple of bottles of Johnny Walker Black Label, which i got to say, ugh, not for me. Yeah. I'd, have been, I'd have been quite disappointed. But nevertheless, uh, okay, fair play. If if I was in the middle of a park a couple of weeks after the nuclear apocalypse, maybe I would maybe I would drink some Johnny Walker. But it would take a serious fucking occasion to make me um, settle for Johnny Walker. But their plan of camping out with a fire and booze in an open park tends not to be that great because... There is a cool bit, actually, when, when Deal is there, he, he spots some figures in the mist, and it's quite atmospheric, it's quite spooky. But it turns out it's a group of survivors who are led by a black man in a see-through Pacamac, and they're all armed, and this man who leads them, we end up with a little bit of rape threat with Kate. But we have to talk about this. We have to talk about Jackson and his presence in this book. You did miss one thing I want to bring up. Go on. Is that he talks about a Dealey knows that the rats have been kept and studied and bred in right. government research facilities. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's causing two different kinds of mutations, one of whom is the normal black rat, and the other one is a grotesque. Yes. That's all only how he refers to it. Yeah. That will come back later on, will it? As Culver recalls. Yeah. But we have this, uh, we have this. See, now we've got Jackson. Now, I don't recall Herbert ever including a black protagonist in any of his early books, but now we have one. We've got a, got a black guy who's part of our, our group. He's fairly thinly drawn so far. I think the fact that he's black is really only incidental. He could have been yes. black, he could have been white. It's, it doesn't really play into anything. The point at which it plays into something is this section here. And there's one line which completely doesn't ruin the book for me or anything like that, but, but, but it does give me pause about how progressive i thought james herbert was being with with his growth when it comes to this stuff so royston is the leader of this group of survivors who um herbert takes great pains to explain that he's black royston carefully laid the air rifle on the ground but kept the knife blade pointing upwards and approached kate once more she glared angrily at him but fear was in the expression too royston laid the blade flat against the cheek and the cold steel was as repugnant as his touch his face was only inches away, and she thought that the smell was from the sores and scabs on his skin and not just his breath. His ulcerated lips moved slowly, as if it hurt to talk. You need a lesson, white lady. You ain't got the say no more. He twisted the blade so that the sharp edge was pressing into her cheek. Kate tried to pull away as blood seeped onto the discoloured metal, but the hand in her hair held her firm. What the fuck you doing? Jackson screamed, outraged by the reflections on his own race as much as the assault on the girl. Right. Was the only purpose of the Jackson character to be a representation of Herbert's misguided need to suggest, look, not all of my black characters are reprehensible criminal stereotypes? I hope so not. So fucking jarring that. There is the evidence, you know, of the, you know, he's just one of the good ones. Yeah. Because, because like the moment of that Jackson and Royston start talking, it almost slips into the um, you talk jive scene from Airplane. Yes, it does. And and that that line, outraged by the reflection on his own race as much as the assault on the girl, it's is it it's such an odd, clumsy choice. To is it some form of weird form of like rehabilitate? I don't get. It. I don't get w what he's doing with this character. That this character feels guilt on behalf of his race because a black man is being threatening. It's so fucking bad. Yeah. It's a clumsy... I'm, obviously, you're reading these things by today's standards. It's a clumsy choice, but it's funny. Sometimes you think back to, you know, when you when I was the age when I read this, this would have completely gone over my head, obviously, because I was probably... I think I was, I was still at junior school when I read this. I was 11 or 12 when I read this, because 
when we get to the government bunker at the end, I wrote a piece of, I wrote like a, a story in English class, which told the story of how Thatcher and her cabinet got eaten when they got into the government bunker. <laughs> and I was, yes. I, was, I was at junior school in Mr. Wilson's class. So I was 11 or 12 when I read this. So this is completely lost on me. But we so thought... did you have to get a trip to the headmaster's office after that little story? No. Um, my English teacher was a guy <laughs> called Neil Simmons, right? And I fucking love Neil Simmons. Many years later, well, not many years later, when I was about 15, I'd gone on to senior school. When I was about 15, we went on holiday to Spain because a place called Palamos. I think Palamos is one of these places that kind of blew up on the Costa Brava. Um, no, it was Costa del Sol in Spain. It blew up with British holidaymakers. We went on holiday there a couple of times. And the second time we went, my sisters didn't come. And I just went with my mum and dad. Because I think they were probably 18, 19 by that point. But I was 15. And we were walking down uh, one of the streets where all the bars were. And there was a German bar called the Frankfurter Koenig. <laughs> of course, there's a German bar called the Frankfurter something. And, and I looked across the street. And my old English teacher from junior school, Neil Simmons, was sat there. And he waved. And to cut a long story short, he was in the second week of his holiday and we were in the first week of ours. And I spent a week getting pissed with my old English teacher from junior school. And I'd already, by like the third day there, I'd already read all my Target Doctor Who books that I took with me. I took mm. three or four Target Doctor Who books. So he, he lent me half a dozen P.G. Woodhouse books. And that's nice. the first time, first time I ever read P.G. Woodhouse. I think he lent me Smith in the City. A couple of Jeeves and Wooster ones, Blanding's Castle one, I can't remember. And I, I just had a great time with him. So he was awesome. I fucking loved Neil Simmons. He was I, great. So... I, I have never read any Woodhouse. And part of me is just kind of going, which target Doctor Who books were they? Oh, God, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah, I can't, yeah. I, may I, can... I say, children, don't go drinking at 15 with your teachers. Oh, uh, well, by this point, I was already drinking in Shire Ross in all <laughs> with some of my schoolmates by the time I was 15. But I, I, I looked, you know, I was just one of those kids who I was a big lad. I looked older. Sorry, going back to my original point, we caught a bit of, of a bullseye episode earlier on because bullseye's always on challenge. So we were reading our tea, our fucking stick challenge, and let's watch some bullseye. And Kenny Lynch, the famous black comedian, Kenny Lynch was on Bullseye. And this episode of Bullseye was probably round about that time, 1982, 1983, something like that. So Kenny Lynch, famous black comedian, Kenny Lynch, who had a partnership with Jimmy Tarbuck and used to play with Roy Castle and all these other people. He was on for about 60 seconds before he went and threw at the board, right? And in those 60 seconds, he made one real joke, and that was about being more used to chucking spears than chucking darts. And sometimes when you look back at stuff from when you were 10, 12 years old, it's actually shocking just how fucking bad things were, just how backwards yeah. we were in that respect. I mean, you only have to watch some of the old bullseyes. Jim oh, Bowen, God. fucking hell, some of his jokes are so off colour. Very Not, homophobic. Yeah, it, it's always homophobic stuff, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And yes just incredible really so i suppose whilst it's easy to to get you know worked up and incensed by this really clumsy use of a black character you just have to insert the old of its time disclaimer yet yeah again, i think but yeah. it, it is amazing it is amazing looking back fortunately we don't have to dwell on it too long because culver turns up with an axe <laughs> and saves the day and starts laying into people and it is another one of those occasions where Despite that, it is really satisfying to have Culver turn up and start hitting people in the spine with his fire axe. Well, he severs the Royston's spine, doesn't he, with one he does. blow? He does. <laughs> um, unfortunately for Jackson, he was getting his face pushed into uh, a fire and he's got a meat hook in the shoulder. So Jackson's not doing very well at no. the moment. Young Dean, he gets shot in the head with an air pistol. Now, I'm not entirely convinced a Webley Tempest to the temple would actually kill anybody. I don't think it would have the power to penetrate someone's skull, but I don't know. But it whatever. did say it penetrated, though, did the... I know, but how, how would, it, how would shot... it kill you? Maybe he had a heart attack. Yeah, maybe. well, he's only young. But, it, I mean, it doesn't matter. He had zero development other than being stocky and young, didn't yeah. he? So he was just there. He was just there to be killed, I suppose. And, I don't know, Chapter 4 solves our Jackson problem anyway because a building falls on him. So, uh... He's very, yeah, he's, he's very not deluded. He, he doesn't know where he is. He's confused Yeah. from the burns yeah. right through to his bones. Yeah. The whole encounter with the desperate survivors... Um, was just ruined a little bit for me by this use of this one black character. 
Anyway, there's five of them left, and we now know Culver's interrogation of Dealey revealed that the main bunker under embankment, the main government bunker, is their new destination. Mm. But the entrance is buried under rubble. Oh, no. Yeah. But this chapter where they find this, I really like. It restores what Herbert does really, really well, where you get this, like, mini travelogue. So after passing a burnt-out train, Culver dwells on what the passengers must have experienced when they came into Charing Cross just to hear the air raid sirens going. It's a great passage. Then we get this mini travelogue as the work where through what was the heart of London in their efforts to find an alternative entrance. Below, oh, just, just actually, sorry, just before on. you read this, I, I just, sorry, I, for, I forgot to, when, after the buildings had fallen in, they thought Culver had died. When he turns up, then Kate basically loses her shit and yeah. becomes uncontrollable because she thought she'd lost him. Yeah, she becomes hysterical. That yeah. that was that was basically like a Doctor Who cliffhanger, wasn't it? The buildings collapsed. Oh no, where's Culver? Ooh, <laughs> yeah, and then the, the beginning of the next episode. Oh, here I am. Oh, it's thank fine. goodness. Yeah. Well, yeah, oh. they all missed him for all slightly different reasons, which was good. But it's like, okay, the woman's going to sob her heart out for 20 minutes. Yeah, I think there is, there is yeah. a reference, isn't there, that Daly thinks, um, yeah, he's a knobhead for interrogating me, but we need him. Yeah. The sun's fierce rays sucked up moisture from the Thames so that it looked as if the water were boiling. Somehow it appeared to him that here were the intestines of the city's torn body, exposed to the light and still steaming as if all life gradually diminished. Masts of sunken ancient boats, those that had been converted into smart bars and restaurants, jutted through the rolling mist. Pleasure boats, their surfaces and passengers charred black, drifted listlessly with the current. The longboat funeral pyres of a modern age. A stout wall still unbroken lined the riverside, and the waterline was high, lapping over the small quaysides that were situated near the broken bridge. Much of the gardens on the other side of the road from the embankment wall were buried beneath fallen office blocks, but here and there a tree stuck through the debris, protected from the worst of the blast by the very buildings shattered around them, leaves washed clean of dust by the constant rain and flourishing under the humid conditions. Culver's eyes moistened at the sight. Incredibly, that's only the second incidence of, the, of, of moist. That's pretty good. That's pretty good that's, for James Herbert. And that's about eyes. Yeah. That's yeah. About, so that's a 50-50 strike rate. Two incidences of moist, only one was in reference to Lady Parts. And I think there might have been a third early on when uh, Culver was talking to Kate and she was opening up. I think she had moist eyes as well. Oh, ah, so that's three. Okay, one in three. And to be fair, that one in three, she wasn't actually moist. No. So uh, does it even count? Maybe not. Anyway, after briefly seeing a spotter plane flying down the length of the Thames, they find a possible entrance to the government bunker. And of course, when they see the spotter plane, they're all like, yay, spotter plane. They all get really excited. They axe their way in. Turns out to be quite easy to axe their way into this entrance. But they can hear generators, so they get super, super excited about the fact that they found this bunker. Now, I've got to say, there are about eight chapters left now, but the remaining chapters build to a crescendo and it moves pretty rapidly. And if you're going to wonder how it's going to go with them actually finding the bunker and there actually being sounds of power, well, it goes badly. There's a really effective journey through the old damp corridors and halls of this original World War II bunker. And then, following their discovery of a badly mangled and headless corpse behind a door, they find their way into the government bunker. And it's a hellscape of death. I want to ask Miles at this point, because I only read the start of Lair. Was this where the rats were? The rats are hiding out in a farm uh, close to the Epping Forest. Right. So I think I think my read is that these are the rats which were being kept and studied on, and somehow they made their way to the government bunker. Right, because I remember them being trapped in, and mm. they were putting loads of food in with them. And when I read this, I'm like, oh, is this from Lair? But obviously I missed the the bit about Epping Forest. Hmm. So this is, set, I think, several years after Lair, isn't it? And um, we do find, of course, that the the rats HQ, so to speak. I mean, you know, we can just uh, cut to the chase, I suppose, can't we? After they find this mangled corpse with, without a head, they find their way to the government bunker. 
it's a horrendous scene. But I really do like the government bunker stuff. It's, again, super detailed, really plausible. In fact, I need to remember to make a note of a lot of it because it's a ready-made template for a gaming scenario. If you were going to do something like <laughs> the, the Morrow Project or um, Aftermath or a variation Rifts. on Rifts or a variation on Twilight 2000 set in post-nuclear strike London, all the descriptions of the government bunker in this are absolutely fantastic. And there is actually a part where Ellison makes a very, very good point, actually, because one of the first things they get into is a huge area with loads of armoured vehicles and a couple of heavy doors, which obviously provide egress to the outside world. And Ellison just says, fuck this. This is a death trap. Why don't we just get in one of these vehicles and foxtrot Oscar? But of course, nobody wants to. We found out that the doors won't work anyway. But he had a really, really good idea there. So I was with Ellison on that one. But after, to cut a long story short, everybody's dead. The entire government's dead. All the army down there are dead. They've all been eaten. But not only that, they've been eaten weeks ago. This isn't recent. But we don't get into was... the inner, inner sanctum, do we? At those doors locked because the rice, the rats have eaten through. Oh, yeah, lo loads of it's in lockdown because yeah. we found that the as a combination of gunfire, explosions and rats eating through cables about the only thing that works is the lights because there are backup lights on a different circuit, lights, which is quite yeah. handy. Yeah, I, I was quite surprised that at no point do we get any kind of loving depiction about the possibility the royal family were sent here to be eaten by rats. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I thought that'd be right. I mean, I thought that if that was going to happen, it would be here. Sadly, yes. there is a there is a reference in there. Daly says that the moment things escalated, the royal family were probably moved out of London anywhere. Probably. Uh, of course, of course. Yes. Yeah. So, so sadly, not. <laughs> have you ever seen the film The Day After Tomorrow? Yes, we have. Okay. Quite. This is quite funny. Um, I saw it like my first summer visiting my future wife in the U.S. Yeah. And every time it cut back to the collection of English characters dying in a bunker, or the helicopter with the royal family in it, I am laughing my tits off <laughs> to the point where the lady in front turned around and glared at me yeah. because the, the, it, it, it implies the royal family dies in a frozen helicopter crash and I'm sitting there going my, my I had to get up, apologize and walk to the end of the walk to the end of the aisle so I could continue cackling hysterically yeah my main <laughs> takeaways from all those Roland Emmerich films are just how everything always boils down to either a car or an aeroplane outrunning some form of natural disaster. Oh, yeah. Whether, or, yep. or people doing it on foot. There's even a scene, I think, in The Day After Tomorrow where people outrun temperature drop not... down a corridor. Oh, yeah. Just incredible. So, so shit, those films. <laughs> just incredible. I don't think anybody really does good disaster movies anymore. There is some absolute... Have, have you seen Geostorm? Holy shit. I have not. I think my wife has. Um, yeah. He watched Moonfall. Oh, God. Oh, God. See, I enjoyed that one if only because, like, in the last, like, 40 minutes, yeah. it just goes shit insane in ways I wasn't expecting. Yeah, we, we watched Moonfall and just laughed. We did laugh all the way through. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the, the moon being a spaceship or whatever it was at the end was completely ridiculous. But I think what made me enjoy Moonfall more was just how shoddy it was. The other Roland Emmerich films, they all maintain some sort of standard when it comes to production values, even though the crap. Mm. Moonfall, everything about it is crap and shoddy and third rate, and that I... makes it feel like an enormous B-movie. Yeah, it, it's, it's like when you have your third... Like, the moon is quite literally looming over the characters if the moon is just kind of counts like an aggressive <laughs> jaguar. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Moonfall is more like an asylum movie that accidentally found a briefcase full of money, <laughs> but not enough money. No. <laughs> just more money than an asylum movie would normally have. Yeah, it's, uh, it's terrible, but but in a good way. But I don't think any, but the thing is, I, I'm a Poseidon Adventure man. I'm a towering Inferno oh, man. You know? Oh, God, I watched the Poseidon Adventure earlier this year. Yeah. Loved it, although 
I'm surprised every time you it, the camera cuts to Ernest Borgnine, it looks like the DTs have just kicked in for him. Ah, uh, he's fucking... in his bold up, bold up, bulging eyes, uh, rat face. You know what, Rogo is one of my favorite characters in <laughs> all of cinema because he's always right. Yeah. Is an, is an, yep. is, is the classic example of the knobhead who's always right. And I just fucking love Borgnine anyway. Mm. You, you, you can't not love Borgnine, can you? No. Yeah. yeah. So getting back to the job at hand. Yeah, you know, so Because at, cause at some point officials. we have to go to bed. Even you, Miles, it'll be, it'll be <laughs> your bedtime by the time we finish. And it's only afternoon so far. So, yeah, the find out that this bunker was probably done in weeks ago, probably shortly after all of the emergency evacuees even got down there in the first place. And really, Culver kind of sums it up in one paragraph. He says, uh, Culver found the irony of the situation incredible. A fail-safe refuge had been constructed for a select few. The rest of the country's population, apart from those designated to other shelters, left to suffer the full onslaught of the nuclear strike. But the plan had gone terribly wrong. A freak of nature, literally destroying those escapers just as surely as the nuclear blitz itself. The stupid bastards had built their fortress over the nest, the lair, whatever the fuck it was called, of the mutant black rats, the very spawn of earlier nuclear destruction. If there really were a creator somewhere out in the blue, he would no doubt be chuckling over mankind's folly and the retribution paid out to at least some of its leaders. Uh. As it happens, we also find out Conveniently, and this is this massive parallel with crabs on the rampage at this point, that the find out that the rats are dying too from some form of plague and they find loads of dead rats down there too. They decide to split. But you do get a sense with this, it's like this book could have finished twenty pages earlier than it actually does. That Herbert thought, no, hang on, we need some massive rousing finale. So after suggesting that most of the rats are dead and the ones that aren't dead are dying, there are still enough rats alive to make it interesting. So we get this alien-style retreat through corridors and chambers and sewers with gunfire and doors, and they find themselves back in part of the original World War II bunker amongst more bodies. These bodies, ever so slightly different. At first, they thought the objects lying there were just debris, pieces of misled junk left by previous generations of occupiers. When they looked closer, the chill inside them all deepened. The first object to take on an identity was a severed arm, all but one of the fingers missing. The next was the remains of a head, one empty eye socket bored into and enlarged as though something had been dragged out. A piece of putrid flesh that may once have been a thigh lay close by. The human parts lay scattered around the floor, white bones reflecting the torchlights, dried and shriveled meat lumps standing alone like strangely shaped rocks on a desert of dust. The familiar dread returned, and this time more potently, for they were weakened, exhausted, close to total hysteria. Culver caught Kate as she sagged. She did not faint entirely, but that unconscious state was not far away. Ellison began to head towards the door through which they had just arrived, and Culver brought him to a sudden halt. No, the pilot's voice was firm, almost angry. We're going on. We didn't come across any rats on our way into the old shells, so I figure it's our safest way out. Nothing's making me go back into the sewers. The words rebounded off the empty walls as if to mock him. He continued determinedly. We're going to walk straight through this right to the other end of this room. There's a doorway there and with any luck a stairway beyond. Just look straight ahead and don't stop for anything. Culver set off supporting Kate, keeping her walking, a head touching to his chest. The arm around her shoulder clutched the brownie, its muzzle held erect, ready to swing down into action. He kept the flashlight in his other hand aimed directly at the far doorway. Someone behind stumbled, and he looked around to see Dealey on one knee. A skull, with the back of its cranium cracked open like a hatched egg, rolling to a stop a few feet away. Get up and keep walking, Culver commanded, his voice tight. Don't stop for anything, he repeated. But they did stop, as one, when they heard the child crying. <sighs> oh my god. Now this is where Culver gets a bit dense, I think. I think so. Yeah. Everybody else is not buying it. Yeah, everybody else is like, nah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Nope. 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 Not nope. having this. There's something quite unnatural about this, but he's in total dumb hero mode. And at this point, I'm reading this and I'm looking, I'm going, mm, yeah, it's about 
25 pages left. And all I'm worried about, all I'm thinking is, Fairbank better not die. If Fairbank dies, fuck this book. <laughs> I mean, you know, I knew Ellison was for it because he had to be punished for Dr. Claire Reynolds, right? Yeah. You know, for for getting off on his Sterling submachine gun. But why Fairbank? Why? It was, it was at this point he used a Laurel and Hardy quote, which I don't know how many people would get nowadays, when he follows him down, doesn't he? Tell us. That's another fine mess you get me. Oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> that's iconic. Yeah. Yeah. We have to we have to get this done, don't we? They make their way in to try and find this child, but Dealey, Ellison and Kate stay back in a different room. So Fairbank, because he's a fucking stout block, even Fairbank don't want to go in. Fairbank's like, nah, I don't think so. I yeah. don't think this is kosher. But he goes with Culver because he's a stout fella. And he suffers for it. So the next door chamber was wide and long, its ceiling fallen in many places, low. Parts of the walls had collapsed too, creating deep, impenetrable recesses. In the distance they could hear a faint, rushing, gurgling noise, the cadence of the sewers. Long cobwebs like soot-filled glaze drooped everywhere. Scattered on the broad expanse of floor before them were humped shapes, yellow-grey in the gloom. Smaller, white shapes glowed almost phosphorescently. Dark, less discernible forms lay between. Both men took a step backwards, Fairbank raising the weapon, Culver reaching for the axe in his belt. The edge to run, to flee from this stinking horror-strewn cellar was almost irresistible, yet it held a peculiar paralyzing fascination, and the distressed whimpers could not be ignored. They're not moving, Culver whispered urgently. They're dead, like the others in the shelter, wiped out by the plague. They must have crawled back here, their lair, to die. All those skulls, why all those skulls? Look at them, they've been broken into, through the eye sockets, between the jaws. Look there, holes bored straight through the top of the cranium. Don't you see? They eat the brains, that's why so many corpses we found were headless. The bastards brought them back here to feed off. Those other things? Culver singled out one of the bloated, yellowish-white shapes. Its form seemed peculiarly blurred, indefinable. What the hell is it? Culver had no answer to the engineer's question. He moved closer, fascinated, despite himself. Oh, sweet Jesus. The words faded on his lips. The bloated creature barely resembled a rat. Its head was almost sunk into the obese body, long withered tusks emerging from the slack jaw. Under the strong light they saw there was a pinkishness to the fine, stretched skin, a smattering of wispy white hair its only covering. Dark veins streaked its body, blood vessels that had hardened and stood embossed from the skin. The twisted spine rose to a peak over its rear haunches. The tail curved round like a lash, its surface hard with scales. There were other projections about its body, these resembling malformed limbs, superfluous and hideous in shape. The slanted eyes glinted under the torch glare. But there was no life in them. Ooh. What is it? It's a daily it's a daily mail reader. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? It's Fairbank all... repeated breathlessly. A mutant rat, said Culver, of the same strain as the black, but different. Dealey's words came back to him. He had said there were two breeds born of the same altered gene. A grotesque, Dealey had called it. It was an inadequate description. He had implied they were undergoing some genetic transformation. Oh Christ. So this was the result. <sighs> so they shoot it up and hack it to bits with axes. And it's young. And it's young, yeah. And we get another little revelation about the young, but not till the very end. Yeah. And the very end, only a few pages away. Then loads of rats arrive, but they're all being weirdos and not behaving like a pack. So they all fall upon the remains of the queen and her weird pale offspring. And then they eat Fairbanks, the bastards. Outrageous. This is all Culver's fault. All of it. Well, and and Ellison, because if Ellison hadn't gone off with a gun and the light, they might have been able to shoot the rats off him. Of maybe? course, Ellison panics, doesn't he, and grabs the only gun and flashlight left with Kate and Dealey and hooks yep. off too. But that gives us the truly, blackly, humorous, not end exactly, but a pretty horrific denouement of the hands or legs of Herbert's final mini-account of a poor victim of the apocalypse that is so fucking good. It is brilliant. 
it's verging on William Hope Hodgson-esque cosmic nihilistic horror. This old sewer worker guy who, when the bombs <laughs> drop, lets all his team go and just decides to stay there and sits down in a damp corridor and doesn't move and starves to death while he has hallucinations about having cosmic discussions with God or other things and just sits there while his organs shut down and he starves to death. <laughs> just sitting yeah. still. Just so, several weeks later, Ellison can trip over his legs, <laughs> smash the flashlight, lose his gun, and then wander off through the blackness, trapped in the darkness, turn left instead of right and miss the stairs upwards and wander off into the depths and the bowels of the hallways and corridors of the shelter in London. Wonderful. The book ends as breathlessly and relentlessly as it began with a running fight up onto the Thames and a boat that actually ends up verging on fantasy novel action with Dealey, who turns out in the end to be a decent bloke, Dealey and Culver fighting the way onto this boat. But any thought that Herbert's bloodlust would be dimmed by the brutal but manly death of Fairbank is quickly dismissed when Kate has to not only lose a hand to a rat, but the rat won't let go of it, so she has to have it lopped off with Culver's axe <laughs> because it, the rat won't let go. And right at the last moment, Dealey, who again turned out to be a pretty decent bloke, gets his legs chewed up as he's winched onto the second of two helicopters that turn up to save the day. Because it turns out that that spotter plane did see him, after all, and two Puma helicopters came to look for survivors. Mm. Dealey really did stand up, I have to say. Absolutely. Yeah. De Dealey came good. Dealey had the, really, he had the right intentions, but he was a typical civil servant all the way through, and he was <laughs> all about the mission, and everything else was secondary. So after we've got to the end, We've got the rats bit, which is in italic, and that's where we find out that the new baby rats, they look like human forms, Yeah, which was a bit scary. Yep. So they return to the gloomy underworld, safe there below the ground away from the sun. They soon find the human who hid among them in the darkness, his burbling anguish, his spell of pungent fear drawing them to him. They scratched on the door he hid behind. They began to gnaw at the wood. They took pleasure in his screams. Oh, unlucky, oh. Alison. <laughs> unlucky, Alison. I Alison. thought, well done. <laughs> yeah. But of course, yeah, at the end, Culver ends the novel laughing hysterically at two bizarre realisations. One, of course, is that the pale offspring of the mutant queen had humanoid characteristics. And the other is that the nuclear exchange was limited. Okay, London got nuked to fuck, but it was limited and accidentally started by China, which appears to have been annihilated by everybody else <laughs> <laughs> as punishment for accidentally starting a nuclear war. The end. So do you think Kate will um, hold it against Culver? Is their relationship will suffer because um, he lopped her hand off that hesitation? Well, when he does it, she does go, no! no! <laughs> yeah. And, and not only that, that, he doesn't do it cleanly. He has the, to do it twice. The first one, yeah. and he breaks like, the bone. Like, five years, they're married, they settle down, it's like, oh, oh dear, can you do the washing? Because you cut my arm off. Yeah. I, I suspect her reaction will be less blase than Cliff Davenport's, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, but to be fair, had he not done it, they'd all be dead. Well, true. True. This is true. I hope she appreciates that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Miles, thoughts on domain? This was surprisingly less lurid than I was in, than I was dreading. Like I was expect I don't know, I think I was expecting something a lot more like the dark or the fog. Yeah. I, I was expecting more good morning Kevin style moment of just sheer insanity, but no. It's a really good apocalypse survival thriller. Very much like a Romero like a Romero zombie film where the true enemy the, the rats are the enemy, but it's just the um clash between the upper and middle, the, the upper classes of Dealey and the lower classes of Ellison mm. that really propel most of the conflict in the book. It is surprisingly grounded. Mm. You know, notwithstanding, it's about giant rats, and at the end, some of them yeah. 
got humanoid qualities, blah, blah, blah. It is surprisingly grounded and plausible for the most part. And because all of that background stuff is really fucking plausible, it makes it all work. Phil, what mm-hmm. about you? So I, I felt very early on, this was a real page turner. I was sucked in and I love that from a book to want to keep going back to it. So I have to say, I was pleased his style of writing has improved. Mm. I have a little section you want to read and I'm hoping from what you said, Miles, that he, his books of the future improve and it makes me want to m- read more. But this kind of says where his head was still at. Mm. So it was it was when the aeroplane had gone flying over and they wasn't sure if they'd seen it. Yeah. Yeah. And Fairbank had gone, shit, shit, shit. He couldn't miss us, said Ellison. He may not have spotted us through the mist, says Dealey. It's clearer here. There's a chance, says Culver, weeping, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I forgot just, about that. And I read it and I was like, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> but I have to say it is a vast improvement from female characters in the rats. <laughs> Yeah. So that was a bonus, and I, I really did enjoy the book. No poorly drawn lesbians. No. No. <laughs> no awful misanthropic sex stuff. Just just good page turning thriller based action. Yeah. I can't believe how easy all James Herbert is easy to read. You know, notwithstanding the point I made earlier about the Jackson character, I thought this was wall to wall pretty fantastic. Which brings us on to our companion movie choice. Rats. What do they want from us? Rats. Why are they man's enemy? Rats. They are watching and waiting. Rats. Their time has come. Why do rats repel us? What is it about those little furry bodies that's so frightening? Just think of them close to you. They're here. They're coming. God, no. Who could stop them and how? Rats are here, under our feet, all around us. Come on, out in the open so I can smash you to pieces. Come to the slaughter. A strange rat from another community came into it. He was soon killed. And afterwards, he see the teeming millions, their little red eyes gleaming with rage and hunger, and they are waiting for you. No! I don't want to die like that! No! Don't lead us alive! I'll kill us all! Kill all of us! I'm warning you. Drop the guns, Kurt. Go on. We'll never get away. You two move that console and barricade yourselves in. No. I'll try to stop them. Rats, they're waiting for you. Tonight. Because this is your night of terror. Here come the rats. As part of the patron poll, of course, we suggested that we would also watch a companion movie. In this case, Rats Night of Terror. Because there is no domain adaptation, but it's got rats in it. It's set in a post-nuclear apocalypse. So I thought, it'll do. So it's a Bruno Mattei film, who was a specialist Italian schlock director who did all sorts of stuff. The other main film I know by him is Hell of the Living Dead, which is a personal favourite because it's just so bad. And it, it it mixes up stock footage of New Guinea to try and convince you. It mixes up stock footage really badly from New Guinea to try and convince you that the little part of Spain that they filmed it in is really New Guinea. It's a, a, a really entertaining zombie flick. But, you know, we watched it and I was going through it thinking, right, okay, post-nuclear attack, check. Okay, it's set 223 years after a nuclear attack, so it's a little bit further out. But it's got rats in it. Check. Okay, not giant rats, but lots of rats. 
It's got a crazy bunker-related revelation at the end. Check. Not one that necessarily you would expect. Pretty close. Plus, it's an Italian post-apocalyptic pulp movie. It's got all those staples. Beards. Check. Studs. Check. Motorbikes. Check. Wacky, cheaply constructed futuristic van. Check. Ace Electro rock soundtrack. Check. Implausible future weapons. Well, one at least. Check. Everyone behaving like complete buttholes. Check. Check. Decent, gruesome, practical special effects. Check. Check. All the boxes ticked. Great hairdos. <laughs> Brilliant hairdos. The, Klaus, is it Klaus, the main guy, with his, his sparse beard, but his gorgeous hair and his red scarf? Yeah. The guy who looks like the Kenny Everett like a character. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. He really does. <laughs> And what what it has that you don't often get too often, almost never with a Bruno Mattei film as well, is reasonable production values. Because apparently it was able to use sets in Rome that were used on Once Upon a Time in America, which was filmed around about the same time, which is quite weird. That reminds me a little bit of Carry On Cleo, to be honest, because Carry On Cleo got most of their production values by using sets and uh, props and costumes from... Anthony and Cleopatra, which was being filmed about the right time. Oh, was it was it Anthony and Cleopatra? Or was it the rise and fall of the Roman Empire? I can't remember one of those. The gang of scavengers do have great hair for the most part, apart from the bald guy. So what is what was the basic premise of crab crabs, of rats, night of terror miles? Well, you have um, a collection of bike punks, survivor survivors who are looking for supplies and they come across a they come across a building like a saloon and they find a bunch of dead bodies and they find fresh water and food that's being grown. Mm. And they find computers and not no video games, much to the disappointment of the <laughs> aptly named video. Yeah. And they think this this feels like a nice place to settle down and have a few drinks and have sex in front of each other. And at no point will any killer rats come and oh no. Now, what unfolds is quite truly a night really of terror. Is. There's a crawl at the beginning, isn't there, that explains that <laughs> um, 230 plus years after the bomb, some people dwell on the surface as scavengers because of, their ancestors decided that the people who survived the bombs stayed underground and other people decided to go back to the surface. So these scavengers are like the survive, the ancestors of people who decided not to live underground anymore. What we get then is essentially... Uh, Steady death by rats action, a little bit of salt on precinct 13, but instead of local gangbangers breaking through the windows, it's someone throwing buckets of rats at, uh, at the actors through windows. Whenever there's any rat action, rats just fly in from off camera and hit people in the face. <laughs> oh, no. At one, at what point? I swear, there's just a bunch of plastic there rats on a mat, yes, there is. which is being yeah. dragged it's like, it's like along. plastic rats on a conveyor belt. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. But as, it goes as, up. <laughs> for all that they use that, every time the actual cut to rail rats, one of two things is happening. No, sorry, one of three things is happening. One is they're being chucked out of buckets, either on someone's head or from off camera, hitting people in the face. Two is they're just sat there on the floor while an actor vigorously waves a torch at them to try and keep them back, and all the rats are just going, <laughs> just cleaning the whiskers and just snuffling <laughs> each other, just being really chilled out. And the other is there is one scene where a stuntman does a full burn and gets set on fire with a flamethrower, and he's got poor real rats on his head falling off in different directions as he's doing his full burn and running off along the floor. And one of them doesn't get off his head. I think they've actually sellotaped it to his head while he's doing this full burn. It's absolutely crazy. It's crazy. Gosh. And they, the, a stuntman does a full burn dive out of a, a, a sugar glass window as well. And when he lands on the outside, rats fall off him and run off in slow motion because the whole thing's in slow motion. So this stuntman who's doing a burn, has got rats on him, real live rats, as he goes and dives through a window. So, I don't know, they either had a really relaxed rat handler, or those rats got some really, really serious hazard pay. So for the rest of the film, I'm watching these rats, and all the tension for me was, don't hurt these fucking rats. For God's sake, don't hurt these rats. Don't step on them. Don't do anything. <laughs> yeah, but that, yeah. You know, that made it 
in a perverse way, that made the film more tense because I was terrified for the rats. But on the whole, they all seemed to have got away with it. Now, I think my favourite character was Taurus for two reasons. One, he had the best beard. Two, he had two amazing lines. There's a shot of him on the bed and you can hear a woman groaning like she's in the sack. And you think, oh, someone, you know, so there's a woman. And he's a bit, bit cheesed off because he's listening to it. And then it cuts to something else. Then it goes back to him. But it's a wider shot. And the two people shagging are just on the floor next to his bed in a sleeping bag. And he says, if you want to copulate, go outside. <laughs> it's fucking brilliant. And then they get, they're trapped in the sleeping bag and can't get out because the zip's stuck. And he lets them out and he says, calmness is the virtue of the strong. It's fucking amazing. Sadly for Taurus, he gets eaten by rats and ends up getting hollowed out by rats, in fact. So he's... It's got everything I love in an Italian post-apocalyptic schlockfest. But I do worry about the amount of rats that maybe, you know, perhaps got got a bit singed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But we do have to talk about the end. So after this, as, uh, at the very end, there's only four of them left alive. Our leader, who previously seemed to be really solid, whose hair is immaculate throughout, just starts to lose it at the end after his girlfriend gets covered in rats and he ends up shotgunning her with his with his badly designed strange future shotgun. Isn't it like a five? It's it's basically shotgun. it looks like they've got the stock and chamber of of, of an uh, an MP thirty eight and then they've just sellotaped a plank of wood and five pipes on top to to make it look like a futuristic five barrel shotgun. It's particularly shoddy. Honestly, but yeah, it ends up being just two of them left. One guy with nice hair, and the only black character in it who's called Chocolate. And Chocolate? as Chocolate. they're trying to survive the rats, yellow biological suit protected people start emerging from sewers and spraying gas everywhere and gassing the rats. And they come into this building and they get our final two survivors from the scavenger gang. And they're really chuffed, they're like, oh, yeah, thank you for saving us, friends. And then you get this, I suppose, I'd like to say iconic shot, but probably only one in every 50,000 people on the who even like these films has ever seen it. But in the final shocking twist, the people from the bunker, one of them removes his gas mask, and it's a humanoid rat. Weird parallel between this and Domain. Humanoid rats turned out to be quite a reasonable choice of a movie. What did you make of it? Uh, I I enjoyed the soundtrack. And I enjoyed the very end, but it just feels really slow. And I couldn't. I I made the I made the crime of thinking about your good post apocalyptic film while watching your your middling Italian B horror. And I'm just watching it going like Mad Max does all this stuff like much better, much quicker paced. And this just felt it felt hmm. really slow in the middle. Because you have constant scenes of the characters going, right, step slowly over the rats because we have to get the water. Wait, did we get did did we get our keys? No, okay, climb back slowly yeah. over the rats. Would we'll do it two yeah, or three times. There is a lot times. of that going on. You have the one character who exists purely to declare himself leader every time our main character gets a splinter in his finger. And you're just thinking, why haven't you thrown this guy to the rats yet? He is clearly going to betray you mm. any chance he gets. He is fundamentally untrustworthy, and you, you've given no reason why you can't. It wouldn't kill be him. an Italian seven, eight, eight is Italian schlock fest if people behaved logically. If anything, this is one of that's, the more comprehensible yeah, the girl... and logical Italian schlock fests I've ever seen. It was even worse when. The annoying screaming woman went on oh, side yeah. because she thought yeah. that he would save her. She deserved to yeah, die. Yeah, the, the old leather blonde did. woman who did nothing but scream. Mm. How the how the fuck oh. did she even survive? And, and, and then there was the the one. And then there was the one who got bit, who who got bitten and got bedridden, who then just goes off by herself and then slits her wrists and yeah. dies yeah. immediately, yeah. only yeah. to get also eaten by rats. And then shotgunned by by future shotgun. Eaten by rats. Yeah, she gets tri triple death. Yep. Then, okay, I, I have a question. There was the one who died because the rat mm -hmm. got in her sleeping bag. Yes. 
and then crawls up out of her mouth. Now, was it me, or was yes. there the implication that the rat yes. went kind of went in through the moist yep. triangle, as it were, to use the um the James <laughs> Herbert parlance, and just kind of crawled his way up through her body to come out through her mouth. That is absolutely pristine. the implication. Yes. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, because they say there's yeah. no marks on her. Yeah. There's no injury. Okay, <laughs> okay good. Yeah. I'm not no. a sick freak. No, that was absolutely no. the implication. <laughs> what about you, Phil? What? You... Now, Phil, we've watched okay, a lot of Italian schlock films because cause I make you watch them, and I made you watch a lot over the years. Where did Rats Night of Terror rank? You have. It was mediocre. So when they found the food and they were eating... I wanted them all. They were a bit worst, bit worstful, weren't they? And oh, seriously, yeah. manners. And I totally agree with Miles. It was slow. They kept going back to the same room. There was no structure yeah. to what they were doing. You know, suddenly one of them went back to the cellar where the water purifier was, whereas before they'd had to all get out together using yeah. a torch. To burn yeah. them, keep them at bay, and like you, like you, you, you said, Assault in Precinct Thirteen. You can do a really thrilling film just set in mm. one central location. Um, it's just it is just unfortunately slow, and it feels like the moment, like the, the ending with the rats, feels like in a different film mm. that's the midpoint, but instead that's your mm. your ending film image, and you just kind of feel okay. We have all the build up, all the build up, all the build up to this Greek credits. Come on. It may not surprise you to learn that when they turned up to start shooting it, that they hadn't paid the script writer. So they didn't have the full script. So they just had to make a lot of it up as they went. They just well, had to that make a, do a lot of it, made it up as they went along. I think this film for me, I enjoy this film. Uh, it's the first time I've watched it for a long time, but I. Watched it a couple of times back in the day. I do like this film. I like Bruno Mattai films. I like how shoddy they are. I like how illogical they are. I just I get a kick out of it. But this one for me, its biggest crime is it is fifteen minutes too long. It's ninety six minutes. This should be a this should be an eighty minute movie. Mm. And a lot of those scenes where they're constantly painstakingly creeping across a room, gently nudging rats aside with the toes so they can get across the room. Rats who are completely uninterested <laughs> in them. They could get rid of. They could get rid of all of it, or, or just at the the very end when you have the 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 jumpsuited rat people come out of the sewers and they're just slowly spray. They're just slowly spraying, very slowly. Cut to everyone screaming. Ev, you know, everyone's dying. Cut back slow. Yeah, leisurely. It's like you know, just one sec. Come on, okay, pick up the face. Power walk your way through yeah. the city. You can do this. I think with that ending, um, they were they were just trying to go the for. Uh, a what the fuck, Planet of the Apes ending. I don't, I don't think there was anything else yeah. behind it than that. Yeah. Oh, it, it ain't the crazies. That's for sure. No, no, it's not the crazies. But it made the the guys at the end made me yeah. want to watch rewatch the crazies because that film is fucked up. Oh yeah, all the way through. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> it's got some really amazing performances in that movie as well. I love the guy who plays his mate, who seems a little bit slow. Oh, I don't, I don't think barely made another film. You know the the main fireman guy. He's got his mate with a curly hair, who who's a little bit slowed, starts yeah. getting affected by the craze. I absolutely love that guy, and it's it's one of those situations where you've never seen him in anything else, and you never will see him in anything else. And all of his manner and everything is completely unique to that guy and to that performance. Absolutely love it. We actually don't mind the remake either, do we? Bro? A lot of those. I've actually seen the remake. A yeah. lot of those George Romero films always. Yes, you get. He just seems to find. This local yeah. Pittsburgh actor who never makes it, who make who yeah. never makes another film again, but it's just distinctive in that yeah. one. That's fantastic. Movie. It just gives them that identity, doesn't it? Those films. Yeah. Well, that mm. was Domain and Rats Night of Terror. That was our Halloween double bill. And despite initial technical issues, we did get through it. And we will get some sleep tonight. Miles, you might even get to do something else with your Sunday. It's, <laughs> it's still early in the day for you. Oh my! I know I, it's great. <laughs> right, it's already nearly dinner time. Wonderful. It's fine. But it happens. Before we go, I'm going to crack my last 
beer, which is a Kakawa chocolate stout from Thornbridge, and it's only 4.5%, so that'll lead me nicely into bedtime. But thank you both once again for coming back to Derry and Tom's to do our Halloween special. Always a pleasure. pleasure. And nice to meet you, Miles. Nice to meet you too. Massive thanks to Miles and Phil for joining me once again to read and talk about Domain, sit through a pretty shaky Italian post-apocalyptic schlockfest, and, most impressively, manage to be patient in the face of some real technical challenges, which will be apparent in the quality of the audio, so apologies for that. You can find the Casual Trek podcast on all the usual podcatchers and via nerdandtie.com forward slash trek, and they probably take the prize for my favourite episode title of the year, the episode with a rock that looks like a dildo. Check that one out. If you're in the mood to check out some of the things we talked about and immerse yourself in the paranoia of Cold War early 80s Britain, check out the BBC's Panorama episode, If the Bomb Drops. It's on YouTube, it's from 1980, and it's the one with a very smug controller and some alarming footage of a war exercise in the worn bunker outside of Hull. Particularly alarming to me, as I lived just a few miles away at the time. Also on YouTube, you can find the 1983 QED documentary, A Guide to Armageddon. The director of that, Mick Jackson, went on to direct Threads the following year, in 1984. Not 1983, as I suggested in our conversation. So 1984 was the year of Threads and Domain. What on earth all this did to my and many others 12-year-old brains is anyone's guess, but it probably explains a lot. Anyway, in other news, we've had some lovely feedback on our last episode with Tara. Guy and Smith's daughter. My favourite coming from 3D Blu-ray Bunker on YouTube, who said, Chaps, thank you so much for this interview. What a joy to listen to this incredibly nice lady speaking about GNS with so much love, and, quite rightly, proud of the huge body of work. I've recently been selling off my last remaining GNS paperbacks on eBay, but whilst listening to this, I removed the last remaining two from sale. I suddenly felt a massive desire to reread them for the first time in 40 odd years. Hearing Tara talk filled me with a strangely overwhelming sense of nostalgia for things I loved when I was younger, and for lost times. I'm even tempted now to start rebuying the 40 or so titles I had back in the early 80s. What a path you and she may have set me on. Thanks again. That was such a treat. All the best. Well, what a wonderful message. Thanks, mate. Paul Mal sent us a nice comment too. Hi guys, great interview. There's a book by Guy that really sums him up. Carnivore set on a country estate with a curse attached. Well worth a read. Can I also recommend Cannibals for a fun, one-shit, schlock horror read? Thanks, Paul. That's another pair for me to seek out. And, as it happens, I think I might have just secured them. Also via YouTube, I got a message from Stephen Sinclair, who said, Dear sir, just subscribed. Love the channel. You might, hopefully, like some of my stories on a channel called The Horror Story Corner. Got a playlist of five tales. Don't know the narrator personally, but he's a gent. They're all part of a book I'm writing. Thanks. Well, thanks for the tip-off, Stephen. I'll definitely be giving your stories a Halloween listen. And for Lovecraft fans, there are a few of his stories on there too. So check out Horror Story Corner on YouTube. And finally for this show, which has gone on a bit, thanks as always to our patrons for keeping this show on the road. First, those without tear, Anthony Piconti, Tim Cardos, Dave Dempster, and Sebastian Weetabix. And our chaos engineers, Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Bill O'Cat, Brandon Mays, Craig Ledley, Dave Griffiths, Dave Voxman, Gabriel Laycock, Harvey Faulkner Aston, Jim Kirkland, Jim Knight, John W. Lays, Jules Lawrence, Mal Pertwee, Mary Catherine, Matt Saltz, Nelbert, Ofa Ziv, Paul McRandall, PJ Cooper, Scott Butler, and Simon Perrins. And to our crafty jugaderos, Alexander Harris, Eliel Weston Ra, Loz, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Graham Holden, and Toby White. And finally, of course, eternal thanks to our patron demons. Tone Malazzo, Alistair Davison, Andy Clark, Andy Darby, Dave Lee, Fred Keish, Gareth Wilson, Greg Faulkner, Gwen Barlow, Ian Stead, Imria, Janie Stim, Jason Vogel, Jay Risa, Joe Monty, Lee Gary, Mark Hebden, Marius Latowskis, Miles Reed Labatto, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, Tom Murphy, the OG patron Norman Beresford, 
And of course, last but never least, Robert McMillan. Right, enough from me. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins at outlook.com and the webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. We have our Patreon page too. There are a few extra odds and sods on there. But for now, take care. Stay safe. We will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Roads. Thank you.